Hello, and welcome to panel four of the Schiller Institute Conference, The Coincidence of Opposites, the Only Truly Human Thought Process. We are changing something at the beginning of our program because this morning we joined the world in recalling and recognizing the importance of United States Senator Mike Gravel, who passed away yesterday. Gravel immortalized himself as a man of courage with his release of the Pentagon Papers back in 1971. And he also appeared in several conferences with our organization. On September 12th, 2015, he joined Helga Zepp LaRouche, Ramsey Clark, and Lyndon LaRouche in a forum in New York City. I should say, a former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who also, by the way, passed away this year. The three World War II veterans, Clark, Gravel, and LaRouche, enjoyed each other's company, and they enjoyed discussing the marked differences and remarkable convergences in their respective views of the world. We have a short uh, video in which Mike Gravel described the dangers of the present day, his earlier life, and how he faced the truth. So it's the, it's the total human insanity we have that we can deal and manipulate and, and control the bomb. We can't. Not at all. And we're victims of circumstance. And, and so when I take your, your views, uh, they're as valid as mine. But my view is optimistic. I'm not old enough yet to be totally pessimistic. But my view is that what China is doing, <laughs> what China is doing, and with the, help, uh, with the help of Russia and with the BRICS, is really where the future of mankind lies in terms of solutions. Not our leadership is going to be what they're doing and how they're handling it. And as I pointed out to you uh, earlier, uh, Putin has run things very well. After the provocation of the Ukraine, and, and most Americans have forgotten that we're the ones that did this. We're the ones that did it. But you don't hear that anymore in the press. It's, it's all, and uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the recent frontline piece on Putin's way. It was horrible. This, and I have an intelligence background when I was 23 years old. I was a top secret control officer. Uh, at 23, mind you, I was in uh, Germany as an adjutant for a communications intelligence service. And our cover was the CIA. See, and what did we do at this place? There's only two military officers, myself, 23, as a second lieutenant, and a lieutenant colonel who was uh, in the sauce a good part of the time. The rest of it were run by, uh, by Germans, uh, and, uh, and what we did is we opened people's mail wantonly and wiretapped people in Europe wantonly. Now, that's when I was 23 years old. So you can figure when we had the Pentagon Papers come up, in, in the Senate, and, and a senator could not go in and read the papers uh, except being under guard, couldn't take any notes. All I could think of is when I was 23, I was acting with more power than any senator can act right now in viewing the Pentagon Papers. So little wonder that when Ellsberg approached me and said, would I read the Pentagon Papers as part of my uh, filibuster against the draft? I said instantaneously, of course, yes, I would. Those of us who were of draft age at that time remember Mike fondly. We remember his irreverence, his courage at a very dark moment in the, in the United States' history. And our condolences and our affirmation of his courage go out to his wife, Whitney, and his family. So we will now begin our panel and we will first uh, hear from one of the co-founders of the Coincidence of Opposites, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, former United States Surgeon General. And she will be introducing the next uh, message, which will be coming from Dr. David Satcher, whom she refers to. And he was 16th Surgeon General of the United States, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Health, and former Director of the Center's for disease control and prevention. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be able to be joined by Dr. David Satcher this afternoon for this very important Chile conference. 
Greetings to all of you from all over the world who are assembled today to forge a future, future for the common good of all people. Over a year ago, I was called upon by Helga and others to help initiate the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites to address the pandemic and feminine crisis that's going on over the world. I stated at that time that the biggest problem in my view is that we have a sick care system, not a health care system. A health care system involves the prevention of disease. It involves preventing through public health measures a disease from becoming an epidemic. It means preventing an epidemic from becoming a pandemic. It means guaranteeing that no human being, no matter how poor, no matter in what country they live in, is left behind in the treatment and prevention of this virus. Our progress has been substantial with the rapid development and deployment of several vaccines in the United States and internationally. However, if we look around the world, the battle is not over. The virus is raging in Africa and nobody knows exactly what the figures are because there's little testing. In South Africa, a third wave of infection has begun. In the last two weeks, it is doubled, going from 3,700 daily infections to over 7,500 daily infections. And deaths have increased 48%. In Brazil, more than 500,000 deaths of people have died of COVID. There are reports that the new Delta variant it's who, the suit in the country is, is more than 10 to 20 times more infection than previous strains. This all illustrates what we said last year. This pandemic will not be defeated until the whole world is cared for. Not just vaccines, but with a full modern health system in every white nation. This emphatically includes, as I've stressed in my past presentations to the Schiller Institute, must have water, food, and energy, as well as hospitals, skilled medical personnel, and com community health care workers. We must address the pandemic, but out of the, this true mark of success, we must prevent future pandemics from occurring. To accomplish this, the whole world must come together now. We must engage young people in this mission. Let us all work together in the spirit of cooperation, not confrontation. There is still a lot of work to be done and we must try and get it done. This virus has opened our eyes. We now have 2020 vision. So as we visualize the problem, conceptualize issues, and actualize the needs to be done, <coughs> let's get, get together and make it happen. Not watch it happen or let it happen, but we must prevent it from happening. We must get together. Let's start. Now, we've got to be successful. You can't afford to fail. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, let me say that I'm delighted to be able to join you and to be here with Dr. El Elders and uh, members of the Sheila Institute. I'm very uh, impressed with your, with your work and what you're trying to do in the world to make the world a better place. 
Um, and I agree uh, with Dr. Elders that that should be built around public health. Uh, medicine is very important. I've spent a lifetime in medicine, but I believe that the critical issue is how do we come together in public health? I, I like the definition of public health, which says that public health is the collective efforts of a society to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. And when you think about it, uh, whether we're talking about COVID-19 or, or any other challenge uh, to our health, including the epidemic of violence and uh, famine, uh, somehow we have to bring people together collectively and work toward a common goal. And that's what public health challenges us to do. I'll just say a word about some of the opportunities that I've had to work in public health. I, I recently spoke to students at Harvard and King Drew about the, the highs and lows of public health. And, and invariably, when I think about the high points of public health, I think about immunizations. I think about the common efforts that started really, I think around 17, 96 and resulted in the eradication of smallpox in 1978. And then of course, um, uh, we have launched major efforts, as Dr. Elders pointed out, in terms of trying to eradicate polio. And I think we're on our way. Uh, it is interesting, of course, that um, uh, one of the barriers to eradicating polio uh, it has very little to do with medicine and more to do with violence. As long as there is fighting in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, we're not gonna be able to eliminate polio from those areas because we can't get vaccines to children. And so it, it is true, as you pointed out, there's a need for coming together of people uh, across political lines and the other things that we allow to divide us and coming together and working for the common good, especially of children. Um, Dr. Elders uh, mentioned, I believe, the fact that when I was director of the CDC in uh, the mid nineties, uh, before I became Surgeon General, uh, we, we made a decision that we were going to launch a major effort to eradicate polio. We had seen the success of the eradication of smallpox around 1978. And uh, this was the early 90s when I was director of the CDC. And we decided that it was time to take on polio. And so we set out, we targeted India and Africa. India at the time had the, the largest number of persons with polio and Africa was was very close. But anyway, um, the CDC launched a major effort uh, in India where the smallpox program had been so successful. We launched an effort to um, eliminate polio and I'm using words eliminate and eradicate with the understanding that when you eradicate a disease, it does not exist anywhere in the world. So what, what happened in India with smallpox, the last cases of smallpox were seen in India uh, around 1978. But uh, in terms of polio, we have eliminated polio from many places, including the United States. We haven't eradicated polio because as long as polio exists in other countries, it's sort of like the philosophy of this organization. We're all in this together. So as long as there is polio, uh, we all have the risk of polio, or polio, if you will, and it's going to take a working together to, to get there. Uh, the definition of, pol of uh, public health, which I like, I, I repeat, is that public health is the collective efforts of a society to create the conditions 
in which people can be healthy. When you think about it, those conditions include, you know, what we're struggling with right now, getting people uh, immunized. It is, a, it is a very strong position to be in, to have the overwhelming majority of your population immunized against COVID-19 or any other uh, polio, whatever the problem is. It's you know, it's a very strong position when you make available to everybody, all of the citizens, what they need in order to avoid becoming infected with the virus like polio or like COVID-19. And that's what we're working toward now in terms of COVID-19. Public health is indeed um, the collective efforts of a society, and that's important, to create the conditions in which people can be healthy. And, uh, And we've had some success in that, but we've also had some major failures in terms of uh, trying to make sure, number one, that quality quality care, if you will, uh, quality public health is a reality for everybody. And it's uh, we're not there yet. Uh, but the, the first thing I think is to realize that that's what we're after. We're after a strong public health system. Now, we're not leaving medicine behind because um, a strong public health system includes strong access to health care, not leaving people out, but making sure that it is available to everybody. So a strong public health system includes medicine. Medicine is a part of public health. Uh, and so we, we really have to make sure that we have a health care system that's available to everybody. And without that, we don't have a strong public health system. However, medicine alone is not public health. Uh, medicine alone is not public health, so we have to keep working to make sure that those conditions exist. Well, um, let me say that I have lived through uh, a lot of experiences here in the South. Uh, I'm here in my office in Atlanta, uh, which is on the campus uh, of Morehouse School of Medicine. And I went to college here at Morehouse College. And in the early 1960s, became involved in the student movement. And so that student movement uh, did a lot to motivate me for my career in medicine, because um, I didn't come to school to go to jail, but many of us ended up in jail, some of us even in prison, not just for the sake of getting arrested or what have you, but because we believe that we had a responsibility to help to make the world a better place than it was. When I came to Atlanta, of course, uh, there were stores downtown where we couldn't, we couldn't uh, shop, uh, couldn't work. So all of those things had to change. And I must say, I, I lived to see most of them change over a four to five year period here in Atlanta. Atlanta is a great place, but it had to go. It had to overcome some real challenges in terms of how we view people and the rights of people. And I was very pleased to have been a small part of that. Dr. Mays, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays didn't encourage us to go to jail, but he also didn't stop us from going to jail. I think uh, he would have probably had to deal with our parents if he if he encouraged us to go to jail. But he certainly talked on Tuesday morning about the importance of standing up for your rights, uh, about the power of resistance. And you can imagine the impact that that had on Martin Luther King Jr. more than 10 years before I became a student here. That was Benjamin Elijah Mays, a tremendous leader who said that uh, that we can never take for granted uh, the quality or the purpose of our lives. And we've got to continue to work to make sure that the lives of other people continue to get better. 
And I think uh, the organization that we, we're dealing with now is notable for a common concern for the lives of everybody, whether it's whether or not they get food, whether it's uh, nonviolence. Uh, in so many ways, we have to work together to make the world a better place. Uh, we talk about a lot about George Floyd now, and of course, most of us know that those things continue as we speak. We have a lot of work to do to overcome um, uh, violence. Even though we are committed to nonviolence, we still struggle with violence and uh, will until there's more unity uh, among us in terms of the rights of people and what that means and the role of police and things like that. I. I remember what it was like to, to be arrested, but I must admit that uh, Atlanta was a more decent place when it comes to that than most cities. And even though we got arrested, um, I don't remember being beaten by the police when we were arrested, just getting arrested and going to jail. Well, if we work together, we can make the world a better place. We can eliminate and certainly eradicate COVID-19. We can certainly eliminate and eradicate famine and poverty and hunger, but we've got to work together. We've got to make those things a priority. And I commend uh, this organization for uh, making these things a priority. Uh, peace is not just a word. It's a tremendous asset for any society to have peace and to work together to make the whole world peaceful. So I'll stop there and I hope that this conference moves us forward toward the goal of working together toward the common good. And I know that we can do that. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Satcher. Also, thank you, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, who was uh, the head of Morehouse College for almost 30 years and whose students included Martin Luther King, Julian Bond, uh, Maynard Jackson, John Lewis, Dr. Satcher. Uh, this panel, Why the Coincidence of Opposites is the Only True Method of Human Thought, uh, is principally conceived, as was the conference, by the founder of this organization. What I think is important about what we've just heard from Dr. Satcher is that Dr. Satcher represents what the purpose of the nonviolent direct action civil rights movement was. The civil rights movement was not a protest movement. The civil rights movement was actually fundamentally not a political movement. The civil rights movement was a movement for transformation of American society, and human society as a whole. It had its uh, roots in the African American church. It had its roots also in the nonviolent movement associated with Mahatma Gandhi. But the concept was to change the thinking, change the axioms of thinking. When last year the George Floyd murder occurred, Helga Sepp LaRouche requested of her colleagues, there has to be a better way for everyone in the world than this. It was not conceived of as an intervention merely into the United States in reaction to a horrific incident. That constitutes protest, and often that protest is wrong-headed, misdirected, and manipulated. Rather, it was an idea to take a much older method of thinking, a method that she will describe to you, or, or to you in a few moments, and apply that in this circumstance for the entire globe, and to propose the idea of a new world health platform. So to discuss the method and the mission, it's my honor to introduce the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga Zepp Well, let me first thank you, Dr. Thatcher, for your words, which capture the spirit of what we are trying to do in a very beautiful way. And I could not 
start my remarks also without thinking about the incredible loss of Mike Ravel. You know, if all people in the United States would live up to his standard, the world would be a very beautiful and peaceful place. Now, I want to speak about the coincidence of opposites, <clears throat> which, you know, is may sound strange to some people why I use such a complicated notion, but sometimes you have to have a metaphor for <clears throat> some new concept. <clears throat> it's new and not so new because it comes from the <clears throat> 15th century and it is a method of thinking. Many years ago, <clears throat> I heard, and this is now slightly uh, on a different note, I heard <clears throat> about a science, science fiction book, maybe it was a movie, it's a long time ago, where <clears throat> the story was that mankind somehow had destroyed itself and absolutely nobody was left on Earth. So then representative, uh, said representatives of some other advanced species from another planet landed a space vehicle on our planet to investigate what was the reason for the disappearance of the human species. Now, this was difficult because everything was pretty much destroyed, and the literally only object which they found was a book about the methods of the mafia gangs in Chicago who fought each other uh, for the top position to the death. Short of any other explanation, these visitors from outer space concluded that it was this kind of thinking to fight your enemy to the death is what led to the extinction of the earthlings. Now, if one considers the laws of evolution of our universe over hundreds of millions of years, and then the exponential intellectual and scientific de development of the human species during only the last 10,000 years, it would be pretty stupid to risk the existence of mankind with a potential nuclear war and deprive us of the continued experience making unlimited numbers of creative breakthroughs concerning the understanding of this physical universe, which has at least two trillion galaxies, according to the Hubble <coughs> telescope, and is becoming and deprive the human species in this way from becoming the only immortal species in that universe. We are clearly at a crucial moment in that evolutionary process. Clear that despite the pretenses of some forces, the days of the unipolar world are definitely gone. Definitely we have moved into a multipolar world, but this is not based on the same principles throughout. There is a conflict between those people who, who uphold international law as established by the UN Charter as it was developed out of the Peace of Westphalia into international people's law versus the idea that there is a rules-based order where these rules are made by the establishment of Western countries and what was discussed yesterday made by Wall Street, the city of London, supranational bureaucracies who carry out the policies in the interest of these power elites. We must have a discussion in the United States, in Europe, and throughout the world, how the human species can back, arrive back at legitimacy, not just legality in the international order. The first step is to go back to the five principles of peaceful coexistence. These are first, mutual respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the other. Second, mutual respect and non-aggression. Third, non-interference in the inner affairs of the other. Fourth, equality and cooperation for the mutual benefit. Fifth, peaceful coexistence. 
Now, if one goes back to these principles, obviously the ideas which have been ad adopted in the last several decades, right to protect, humanitarian interventions, wars, regime change, color revolution, unilateral sanction, all of these have to disappear. Multilateralism is a fact by now, <clears throat> but that is not really where mankind should be because multilateralism still has the potential danger of a geopolitical confrontation whereby one bloc says we have those interests which we have to defend against the interests of the other blocks. And, you know, that is why we have to have a radical change in the thinking and have to learn how to think about the one mankind first. This is the coincidence of opposites as a method of thinking. Now, how this idea came about is that Nicolaus of Kuhs in 1437 was on a trip from Constantinople to the Council of Ferrara in Florence, where he brought the entire delegation of the Greek Orthodox Church, all the key thinkers of that time, Plethon, Besarion, the Patriarch, <coughs> and many others. And this was supposed to be the unification of the Orthodox Greek and the Catholic Roman Church, for which he had made many important pre-steps and contributions. Being on this journey on the ship for several weeks, all of a sudden he had what he called a divine inspiration. And he said, all of a sudden, I can think something which no man has ever thought before. Now, the gist of that idea was that up to that point, the principle of non-acceptance of contradictory assertions was the common axiom of all philosophers. And Aristotle, who was naturally the most famous for that principle, was just more, the most explicit. Now, in his first or in his second major work, De Docta Ignorantia, Nicolaus talked about the nature of magnitudes and measurements. He said, <clears throat> the maximum is also the one since it contains everything. Therefore, it is also the minimum since there is nothing outside of it. Now, I want you to understand these examples as metaphors because these are just pedagogical mental exercises, how to get beyond the level of the senses. Now, in this book, Dr. Ignorantia, he also says, an infinite straight line is also an infinite triangle, an infinite circle, and an infinite sphere. The reason is very simple, because the diameter of a circle is a straight line. The circumference is a curved line, and is longer than the diameter. The larger the circle, the more the circumference is less curved and the more straight. And the curvature of the largest circle and the largest line are straightness. The same is true for the largest triangle, the largest circle and the largest sphere. If the thought process does not transcend the senses, one does not understand that a line is also a triangle, a circle, and a sphere. For a person, however, who thinks on the level of comp comprehending thought process, it is very easy. Since the two sides of a triangle cannot be shorter than the third, it follows that in a triangle, when one side is infinite, the other two sides must be infinite too. And since there can be not several infinites, they obviously fall into one. Many more such reflections <clears throat> are in this book, and I'm just mentioning those to whet your appetite to read the entire Nicolaus of Cusa. Now, the, con the coincidence of opposite is not a static condition. It is a concept of change, of the evolution from the non-living to the living, to reason, 
as Megan Dubrod yesterday developed along the ideas of Vernadsky, who spoke Nikolaus of Kusa as the Kusansky, as the great stepping stone to his own body of knowledge. Nikolaus separated the different levels of cognition into four. First, the level of the senses. Second, the level of understanding. Third, the level of reason. And fourth, what he called visio, vision, the level of the coincidence of opposites, where he says one has to sort of think like jumping behind a wall to think the one, but to think it from the standpoint of the hypothesis and the future and future discoveries. Now, we have to educate <clears throat> to think that people think minimum on the level of reason, which is already a big accomplishment, but increasing it to the level of the, co commit, uh, of the coincidence of opposites, you have to think to think the one mankind before any national interest. And the national interest must never be in contradiction to the interest of humanity as a whole. Now, Mahatma Gandhi also added, and he was the source of many of these principles I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> he, meant, he developed the principle of what he called Sarvodaya, which is the idea that one has to make sure that the furthest behind will be the first, and that progress of society is measured by the state of the most vulnerable and the weakest. Now, that requires an emotion which, in Christian terms, is called love, agape. It's called ren in Confucian philosophy. And it requires that we educate our emotions to be on the same level of reason. And this, according to Friedrich Schiller, is possible through the aesthetic education, that you educate your emotion until you can blindly follow them, because they will never tell you anything different than reason demands. This is, by the way, the reason why the Schiller Institute is called after Friedrich Schiller, because we believe that such an education aesthetic education of all human beings is possible and that that is achievable and maybe even in our lifetime. And that is why I think that the first real breaking point in this effort must be to fight in the context of this pandemic and the danger of new pandemics to have a modern health system in every single country, which is both in the self-interest of each of us, of every nation, but I think it must become the absolute turning point in the history of mankind, introducing a new epoch where the one humanity is being put first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helga. And uh, we will be, should uh, say that we're going to be trying to get to a question and answer period a little bit sooner than normal. Um, and uh, people are able to ask questions. We'll be flashing across the screen where you can send your questions. Our next spokes, uh, our, our speech was by, is, is by Boris Meschanov, the counselor of the Russian Federation mission to the United Nation, Nations. And his speech is The Russian Perspective on a Global, Sustainable, and Sustained Recovery. Distinguished President, of the International Schiller Institute, Madame Helga Zep Nelrush, colleagues and friends from the expert community, respected audience of the conference. We thank for the opportunity to present to you some of the Russian Federation approaches to the global recovery. For those who may not be aware, in the United Nations we have decided to build back better after the pandemic. Yet different states and even groups of states have assumed different understanding of how to recover better themselves, and more important, how to rebuild the post-COVID world. To start with, we certainly don't have the privilege to forget the lessons of history. It would be short-sighted and extremely irresponsible. Peaceful development and solidarity free from unilateral cares of measures should be in the basis of the global reconstruction. 
our country has consistently upheld a balanced and sustainable vision based on partnership, development and innovation, fully in compliance with the vision of the 2030 Agenda, unanimously adopted by the United Nations back in 2015. Our country has joined the informal alliance of states defending the UN Charter and its timeless principles of interstate communications, meaning the equality of sovereign states, non-interference with their domestic affairs, the rights of people to de determine their own future, non-use of force or the threat of force, and political settlement of disputes. It is to be recognized at this conference that those principles have very much in common with Mr. Lindel Arush doctrine introduced back in 1984 as part of his proposed draft memorandum of agreement between the United States and the USSR. This is another proof that pragmatic, science and evidence-based political solutions are not subject to space or time limitations. They reflect the logic of history and are promoted by outstanding thought leaders in every generation. Let us hope that another prophecy of Mr. LaRouche will come true, that of the summit between four great powers. For the time being, assuming its responsibility as the founding member of the United Nations, Russia has, has suggested convening a P5 summit of five states permanent members of the Security Council. Second, the idea of a qualitative integrative growth. The concept of integration of integrations was first put forward under the auspices of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. Regionally, its implementation is underway as the consultations are in progress of the alignment of the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative. Broader, our idea has been to form a greater Eurasian partnership involving all Asian and European countries without exception. It is purely pragmatic and increasingly relevant. One can question the feasibility of grand projects of cooperation in our times. Let me reassure those critics and remind them of the first post-Cold War successful cooperation on the Eurasia continent, the Russia-India-China Triangle, invented or rather formulated by an outstanding politician and academician of our country, Evgeny Primakov. The alliance proved successful and was later complemented by Brazil and South Africa, forming the so-called Group of BRICS countries. It is presumed that the optimization of the global value chains may also contribute to the process of regionalization of the world economy. Among obvious new opportunities for global development, let us call Arctic, Arctic development and launch of the Northern Sea Route project. This year, Russia chairs the Arctic Council and the slogan for our chairmanship has been responsible management for a sustainable Arctic. This is a highly important and interesting issue as the development of the entire Arctic region and the Northern Sea Route in particular has tremendous economic significance for many countries in the region and beyond. Primary attention will be given to creating favorable conditions for improving living standards, modernizing the economy, ensuring the region's attractiveness to investment, while efficiently managing the region's scientific and innovation potential and resources, and exercising a very considerate attitude towards the impact that human activity can, can have on the region's environment. The use of the Northern Sea route navigation will become practically year-round due to climate change and as we launch our new icebreakers. Russia has the most powerful nuclear icebreaker fleet, which is in high demand here. The above mentioned principles of peaceful development, cooperation and responsibility lead us to another priority for the global recovery. I mean, the president of Russia proposal to create so-called green corridors, free from trade wars and sanctions, primarily for essential goods, food, medicine and personal protective equipment needed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. In general, freeing the world trade from barriers, bans, restrictions and the legitimate sanctions would be of great help in revitalizing global growth and reducing unemployment. Lifting sanctions is key to peaceful coexistence, development and, as I said before, stable and predictable relations. We noticed that amid pandemic, some Western countries have introduced humanitarian exemptions and started to ease 
COVID-19 assistance to heavily sanctioned countries. This is a small but insufficient step forward. As the newly re-elected Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, puts it, it is time for solidarity, not exclusion. As to health care, just like an economy, we now need to remove as many as possible obstacles to partner relations. Building on the scientific, industrial, and clinical experience of its doctors, Russia has promptly developed a range of test systems and medicines to detect and treat the coronavirus, as well as register the world's first vaccine, Sputnik V. We are completely open to partner relations and willing co to cooperate. In this context, at the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly, our delegation proposed to hold an online high-level conference for countries interested in cooperation in development of anti-coronavirus vaccines. We are ready to share experience and continue cooperating with all states and international entities, including in supplying the Russian vaccine, which has proved reliable, safe and effective to other countries. Russia is sure that all capacities of the global pharmaceutical industry need to be employed so as to provide a free access to vaccination for the population of all states in the foreseeable future. Matters related to cybersecurity and the use of advanced digital technology also deserve a most serious deliberation. It is important to hear and appreciate the concerns of people over the protection of their rights, such as the right to privacy, property and security in the new era. We must learn to use new technologies for the benefit of humankind, seek for a right balance between encouraging the development of artificial intelligence and justifiable restrictions to limit it, and work together towards a consensus in the field of regulation that would avert potential threats to military and technological security, but also to our traditions, law, and morals of human communication. Climate and energy we still lack truly global solutions based on the best available science as formulated in the Paris Agreement. One of the questions, carbon dioxide has been in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Therefore, it is not enough to talk just about new amounts of emissions. It is important to absorb the carbon dioxide that has already accumulated in the atmosphere. Second, we must take into account absolutely every cause of global warming. To that end, we have urged all interested countries to take part in joint research to invest in climate projects that can have a practical effect and to redouble efforts to develop low carbon technologies to mitigate the consequences and adjust to climate change. It is even more irresponsible to sacrifice urgent problems of national development or even survival for many developing countries for the sake of distant climate goals. Russia proceeds from the need to maintain a balance between the need to provide economies and the population with affordable energy resources and solving climate problems. Access to affordable and reliant energy will be a dominant of economic development. The challenge is to make their use as efficient and sustainable as possible. We consider hydro and nuclear energy as a reliable, efficient and environmentally friendly component of the energy complex. According to some estimates by BP and the International Energy Agency, in developed countries, the growth in electricity production using nuclear energy will slow down or it will decline altogether. The main growth in electricity production at nuclear power plants is predicted to come from developing Asian countries, primarily China and India. These two countries will naturally define the situation in the world economy in the 21st century. Russia has provided and continues to provide assistance to many countries of the world in the development of national nuclear energy. Russian turbines and nuclear reactors are successfully operating in dozens of countries around the world. And in conclusion, this event follows the first post-pandemic summit for the leaders of Russia and the United States held on the 16th of June in Geneva, Switzerland. All of the above create setting for the development of relations between Russia and America. Good or at least fair links between us have always been a guarantee of global stability and calm. We look forward to resuming interdepartmental 
consultations on a wide range of issues under the edges of the U.S. Department of State and the Foreign Minister, Minister of Russia to coordinate rules of conduct in all the spheres mentioned in this presentation, strategic stability, cybersecurity, Arctic, trade, and the settlement of regional conflicts. Presidential Joint Statement on Strategic Stability and Strategic Stability Dialogue will be important pillars of it. What we need to do is discard all the conspiracy theories, sit down at the expert level and start working in the interests of our states. As President Putin puts it, there cannot be family trust in this situation, but we think we have seen flashes of it. If I may, the logic of historic process imposes our closer cooperation, notwithstanding many stereotypes, preju prejudices, and myths. It was a positive signal from the American side, too, to announce future summit with China. Referring to the title of the panel, Coincidence of the Opposites, is something we are engaged with on a day-to-day -day basis, many in the alchemy of diplomacy and personal contacts. It is our strong conviction that the post-pandemic world, however new, digital, and sustainable it may be, will not be able to do without personal engagement, both at the high level of politics and with ordinary people. I thank you, distinguished audience, and I wish this panel to hold an open and constructive debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Meschanov. To introduce our next two speakers, we have a few words we'd like to uh, extend as a preface. We have to join the world together in an effort considerably larger than that of the Second World War to create a new health platform. But you can't do it with the mentality of war. You have to do it with the mentality of peace. On our earlier panel this morning, we discussed that the world m needs as many as 1.5 billion industrial, agricultural, manufacturing, and infrastructure jobs to ultimately create the conditions for human life on the planet to be as productive as possible and as healthy as possible. Back 20 years ago, uh, at the time of the anthrax attack, which you remember during the fall of 2001, Lyndon LaRouche uh, wrote a document, which I'm going to read a section of, uh, which was about the idea of public sanitation as a policy against germ warfare. Uh, and our next two speakers are responding in, to por a portion of that document. The portion I'm going to uh, cite is called National Defense as Sanitation. Mr. LaRouche said, The most important principles of national defense against bacteriological and related forms of warfare were consolidated as knowledge in the experience of World War II and the war in Korea. Those lessons were featured in the adoption and implementation of the Hill-Burton legislation adopted shortly after the close of World War II. We must situate the role of the medical profession, both in care for the sick and in other ways, as an essential subsumed feature of public sanitation. I explain this extremely important distinction to be made at this point of our national defense requirements. It is to the degree that we have taken down much of the national defense protection provided by public and related measures of sanitation during the recent three decades that our nation's vulnerabilities to the presently ongoing germ warfare attacks were created. National biological defense means chiefly those measures of sanitation which are essential to improving and defending the life expectancies and well-being of the population as a whole. This includes those measures and institutionalized practices which modern society has come to consider public sanitation. This includes not only safe water, but also improved supplies of energy per capita and per square kilometer. This at declining relative costs to communities and industries and the general public. It includes improved public transportation. It also includes the practice of the medical professions generally. The pivotal feature of the medical profession's role is the general hospital, 
provided as a public institution which is not only a teaching institution, but which serves those sections of the population which are relatively indigent and are therefore the most likely radiators of infectious disease. The public teaching hospital of this type, which is also integrated with the teaching and research functions of a university, is among the most valuable such facilities. Without lessening emphasis on the importance of medical counterintelligence practice, it is public sanitation which remains the first line of defense of the population against both normal epidemic disease and also biological warfare attacks. We require a coordinated crash program sort of attack on both fronts combined. This means that we must move quickly, not only to restore the indispensable Washington, D.C. General Hospital, but to restore those medical and infrastructural defenses which were taken down piece by piece during the approximate quarter century since the enactment of the original uh, health maintenance organization legislation. If we do not do that, whatever might happen to you and your family as a result of biological warfare attacks should be considered now as virtually a done deal. Now, we read this in part because, of course, in the recent days and months even, people have said, where did the coronavirus come from and who did it and why and this and that. Well, the point that was made by Mr. LaRouche 20 years ago is that unless you proceeded worldwide from the standpoint of public sanitation and all of the necessary requirements, water, energy, transportation, and so on that that entails, no matter what it might be, a new disease which is completely unknown to mankind or an attack, you would not be prepared unless you made that investment in public sanitation and public health. And so uh, in, in response in part to this statement and with their own ideas about the statement, we are now going to hear uh, jointly from Major General retired Peter Clegg, U.S. Army, and Rear Admiral retired Mark uh, Polias. Their topic, National Defense Against Germ Warfare, the Military, and Healthcare. It did not take an understanding of the role of germs in causing disease, a relatively recent development, for the threat posed by what today we call biological warfare to be recognized. Even in ancient times, and certainly in the Middle Ages, people became its victims when enemies catapulted diseased carcasses over the walls defending cities. We've all heard of the reported attempts in colonial America to infect Indians with smallpox contaminated blankets. Even in the 21st century, we have witnessed the use of anthrax contaminated letters sent to prominent politicians so clearly, the use of biological agents in both peace and war can be expected to proliferate as science expands the horrific possibilities of their use and at the same time of concealing its origin. The controversy over the cause of the coronavirus pandemic highlights the threat as well as the importance of measures to defend against it. We cannot exclude the possibility that it was man-made or even that it was intentional, however unlikely it may seem to some. Now, what to do about it? We know from the lessons learned by the Army in the Spanish-American War and during the building of the Panama Canal, as well as during World Wars I and II, what must be done to counter the threat. I will focus on six key areas, by no means an exhaustive listing. The importance of every one of these areas has been highlighted by our recent coronavirus experience. First of all, under the rubric of cleanliness, large numbers of people in small confined areas is a recipe for disaster, as the Army has learned in every conflict we've been involved in. This is why the Army places such emphasis on cleanliness, safe, clean water supplies, strict field sanitation, ventilation of indoor facilities, rapid quarantining of sick personnel, frequent washing, 
changing of hospital bedding, frequent inspections of living and dining areas, and related actions are really the first line of defense. And during the First World War, resulted in reducing the severe impact that the Spanish flu had on military operations. Development and use of antibiotics and vaccines, going back to the smallpox vaccinations and the revolution, and the development and use of vaccines against typhoid fever and typhus in the Spanish-American War and during the building of the Panama Canal are examples, uh, but most significantly, during World War II, for the first time, infectious disease was not the number one killer any longer. The third area is medical infrastructure development in both world wars was significant. Design and rapid construction of hospitals and clinics on a massive scale, as well as the development of a medical logistics system to get medicines, medical supplies, and new machinery distributed quickly around the country and in Europe during World War I and around the world during the Second World War had a significant impact and in reducing the death rate as a result of the war. Recruitment, and as well as the draft, and rapid training of large numbers of medical personnel on a scale never seen before or since enabled the, the, the medical branches of the army to build themselves up pretty much contemporaneously with the buildup of forces both in Europe and the Pacific and was a significant factor in enabling us to emerge from both conflicts victoriously. Conduct of research, development and distribution of protective equipment from simple things like screens and insect repellents in Panama to the sophisticated diagnostic equipment which is available today is the fifth area that uh, I will highlight. And finally, of critical importance, as we've seen with the coronavirus vaccine issues, the discipline to get the troops to adopt the protective measures and not evade them, a, a, a good public relations program to educate, persuade, dispel rumors, and deal with misinformation is certainly as important as all these other things that we've seen. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, I happened to be in an area which uh, was significantly affected by the most virulent form of malaria, which is the falciparna malaria. So we had to take both the great big orange chloroquinine pills as well as the little dapsone tablets. And it was always a problem. You'd think who would want to get malaria? But surprisingly enough, it was difficult to get the troops to take their malaria pills. So we wound up having to have them take them in formations where the NCOs and the officers could watch and make sure that it got done. Uh, another example of this, which doesn't relate so much to biological warfare was during both the Korean War and the Second World War. Uh, officers and NCOs had to get the troops out and make sure they changed their boots and socks because of the danger of uh, trench foot in uh, cold weather and wet, uh, wet weather combat. Uh, Human nature is a funny thing. Uh, why do people take drugs? Why won't they? Who would not want to take a, a measure, a preventive measure, to prevent yourself from getting a disease? Who wants to get malaria? Who wants to get all these other diseases? But uh, people are strange, and they have to be led. And fortunately, in the military, to some degree, we have the ability to force them to do it. But in the civilian world, that, of course, doesn't work. You, the, the PR effort is even more important. Um, so that pretty much concludes the six areas that I wanted to highlight. So I, uh, following General Clay, uh, 
I couldn't have said it any better than from a historical context um, and the experiences in this country. As I think about, and, and I'm going to go a little bit off from that, take off from that, to say, what then do we do in the rest of the world? I mean, we do have a hard time even in the U.S. to get everybody to take those pills or take that vaccine. And uh, that is puzzling to me, but um, it is a fact of life. However, we'll make progress here. The, uh, the real issue then becomes it's not we can't deal with this in isolation in this country alone or the developed world alone. It's a global uh, issue. So uh, I think we've talked in the past about uh, the role of the military. Well, yes, the military is a large, well-disciplined, organized uh, entity. And it's self-sufficient, it's deployable, um, it has at its core, obviously, uh, a defensive purpose, but, uh, but it also has capabilities which extend far beyond um, any other organization or entity that I know of. So now you, we talk, how do we take the discipline, the knowledge, and transfer that and use that effectively to um, to go into parts of the world that that don't have that that uh, structure, and so it's a difficult thing. You know, you try and send the military into, for instance, uh, a, a country that's not used to seeing, be it U.S. or French or whatever uh, military organizations. And there's a natural suspicion. So, so the way that works effectively, in my opinion, is you have to be invited and you have to work with the local entities and give them the support, the structure, the, the, uh, all the learning that, you, that we've developed over decades and, and apply it to the situation, whether it's Mozambique or some other place, whether it's food distribution, whether it's disease prevention, uh, access to clean water, uh, all, all very critical items. And it probably takes and will take a uh, coordinated effort by many, many groups um, to to affect that sort of cooperative approach. Uh, it's not just, that's not something that one government can, can dictate and, uh, but in general, it's in the best interest of governments to do that sort of cooperation. It builds goodwill. It's, uh, and frankly, it's, it takes many good steps towards, uh, peaceful coexistence in the world. Um, so there are great opportunities, um, but it, it takes a concerted international effort to make something like that happen. From the military standpoint, I think, uh, as we've said in previous discussions, uh, there's clearly an interest and desire to promote the well-being of all peoples. And uh, on the military side, when the opportunity presents itself, I think it's a very enthusiastic um, involvement that takes place, uh, whether it's sending a, a hospital ship or uh, an army field hospital or uh, other training uh, resources. So I think the conference is, is right to talk about this in in the context of, of an international cooperative approach. And uh, when it comes to whether it's access to clean water or, or disease control or starvation control, 
um, food distribution. Uh, those are areas that uh, should be apolitical and, uh, and we should be able to find common ground. So I, I look forward to the fact that this, uh, this conference and others like it hopefully can promote that level of understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral Polias. Now what we're going to do is we're going to bring up uh, a group uh, for discussion at this point. And uh, I believe I am now about to be joined by Surgeon General Dr. Satcher, Councilor Meschanoff, General Clegg, Admiral Polias, Helga, and I'm hoping that we've also got Walter Faggett from Washington, D.C. There he is. Uh, and uh, Dr. Faggett is with us because we don't right now have Jocelyn Elders, who will be joining us in a little bit, but uh, he's sort of her sidekick. He's also 82nd Airborne. He's also formerly the head of the D.C. medical system. He knows all about D.C. General Hospital, which was referenced before. So let me at this point first ask, uh, Helga, if there's anything that you would like to remark, uh, uh, say, reflections on what you've heard, or anyone that you would like to address a question uh, to at this point. No, I think that uh, what Mr. Meshanov said is very uh, very future oriented, and I also think that the, the recent two contribution by Major General Clegg and Rear Admiral Pereus uh, give me hope that we can maybe come out of this conference with uh, a concrete call to be spread, uh, you know, to promote this idea because I think that we need to have the committee of coincidence idea spread to many countries. Uh, you know, it's working to a certain extent in the United States. We have made contact with some Caribbean countries, but I, I really think to make it the idea that it must become a world health system if we want to really come out of this experience, you know, having learned the most important lesson, then that is now the moment uh, to act because as uh, Dr. Elder said, you know, the Delta variant uh, should underline how urgent it is and that there is no time to to rest and think that the pandemic uh, has been conquered. Councillor Peschanov, let me go to you next. I know you have some restrictions on your time, but also just to get a reflection from you. And also, I understand that you have a certain expertise in the idea of uh, the third world or what's called Africa, Asia, South America, uh, economic and uh, development there. I think you're muted. Uh, hold on. We're not hearing you. No. We're trying to address, adjust it here, so we'll just give us a minute. Okay. No, nothing yet. doing a switch over. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, we can now hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, yes, just two things uh, which uh, I would like to, to comment on. First, uh, uh, what uh, have been much spoken about today in medical infrastructure or probably sustainable infrastructure as uh, um, it is called uh, sometimes in the United Nations, uh, uh, including all, the, that, all those things that uh, you have been uh, spoken about, medical, uh, sanitation, um, access to, to clean water, uh, transportation, uh, all this is uh, uh, high is, is high in our high on the agenda of the United Nations and uh, its um, economic and social council specifically. So I think uh, that uh, the conference converges very much to the discussions, deliberations uh, in, in the United Nations, and this uh, voice is to be added 
to uh, what uh, we are discussing or we're trying to, pro to approach uh, as a part, an inevitable part of, of the recovery now throughout the world, specifically in developing countries, because the United Nations is uh, dealing um, uh, mostly with uh, assistance to the developing world, least developed countries, and there are many other gr groups of countries, as you may be aware, uh, that need um, uh, specific uh, um, attention and uh, uh, in that uh, in that um, uh, in that sense uh, i would like that uh, to say that th this conference is, is is really important and that hurt so many familiar uh, issues uh, it, it, it is very important that uh, these uh, questions are raised not only uh, in the in the frame of uh, specialized organizations but also wider in the world uh, and with the, the experts uh, uh, throughout all the continents so this was uh, very encouraging for me indeed uh, to, to, to hear about uh, uh, today uh, to, hear, to hear about uh, this sustainable infrastructure issues uh, which like uh, also to give our voice of support to, to these deliberations uh, and also uh, on the uh, what um, um, Mrs. Uh, Zep Larouche has told that well, uh, my um, intervention was dealing more with the future, uh, with things um, of, 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 of future discussion. Uh, I think that what uh, I, I tried to start with uh, is uh, 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 the key and the core part and was what was the core part of uh, my intervention and, and presentation basically today uh, is that we uh, must uh, learn lessons and uh, speak about uh, principles of, of international law and very um, in a very proper manner um, Miss, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Zeplarush differentiated international law from the rule-based order, something that we are struggling uh, with in the, in the United Nations. And it is very much important that the, the Western audience uh, knows about that, knows about these discussions, uh, because uh, throughout the mainstream media, we uh, uh, have been used to, to, to hearing about rule-based order and there, there is confusion of terms indeed in, in, this, in this sphere. What uh, our country and like-minded countries uh, and your institute uh, have been supporting is um, international law-based order. Uh, we must be very strict and precise in, in, in uh, uh, using uh, these terms because indeed uh, uh, something that uh, challenges and claims the um, uh, natural, I, I would say, shift to multi-polar multi uh, world now is this rule-based uh, uh, order, uh, and we see it as a clear threat. Uh, uh, I think that that is also threatening the the coincidence of, of opposite of opposites because uh, this is a school of thought uh, which uh, excludes dialogue and excludes cooperation. That is very, uh, very dangerous. So uh, these are two points that uh, I would uh, specifically like to, to comment on. And, and thanks for, for raising them in your discussions. Let me say that, uh, Helga, do you want to respond? Or, because otherwise I will. Oh, no, thank you. Sure, well, yeah, well, you have an admiral and a general on from the United States. You are from Russia. I want to see particularly because Mark made a very specific intervention in terms of how he posed at the, the, what we showed of your discussion. I just wanted to see, Mark, if you have anything to say on how, because uh, you you've referenced some things about this idea of the role of the military as a whole. And just wanted to see if there's anything you have to say at this point. Well, I think, I think um, you know, the discipline, the lessons learned, the historical uh, background that each of our military organizations, being the most, I would say, most sophisticated uh, organizations in each of our developed, in each of the developed countries, in terms of 
being able to deploy, to deal with with adverse circumstances, to deal in uh, in uh, uh, rapid response, uh, not not in terms of uh, war, but in terms of dealing with whatever the emergency or situation may be. So we have a great body of knowledge, and and it it seems to me that. If you're if you're trying to establish a uniform uh, healthcare uh, and institutions, uh, we should be we should realize we're dealing with a lot of varied factors, uh, a lot of prejudice in 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 individual societies to how healthcare is uh, is handled. Um, and a lot of, um, frankly, uh, a, a lack of experience in the sort of universal um, standards that that need to be applied. So, I mean, there clearly there are resource issues, and and developed countries can come and bring resources to bear. I think the United Nations is always looking for that. Uh, but beyond that, I think we have an opportunity collaboratively to, to define the standards that must be in place to achieve what I think Ms. LaRouche was saying very eloquently um, and what you would like to see across the globe. So uh, perhaps where we should be starting is to develop uh, the some standardized documents, perhaps some some way of describing that some common principles that then we could jointly work to apply. And I think that you know that's that's a that's a non-confrontational thing. That's a very and it's a very doable thing. Uh, I'm certainly not a healthcare expert. Um, I was a nuclear submariner, so for my Russian friend there back during the Cold War. So, uh, but but that's not the issue, you know. And this, and I think that uh, all all military people actually are fighting for peace, and uh, so you find a willingness to share lessons learned. Uh, we have a lot of military to military uh, joint exercises, cooperative uh, discussions. Uh, that are very, very fruitful in that context. Now, if we were to take some of that knowledge that we have and develop those standards and promulgate them and all work towards those as, as key points, uh, I, think, I think we can make progress. It's, it'll be slow, but I think we can do it. So that's just my yeah. first reaction. Th thank you, Mark. Uh, Dr. Satcher, I wanna come to you uh, because, of course, you are a military man, you are a Surgeon General, and you uh, spoke uh, before quite a bit about what you think about public health. Also, I know you may have some time constraints, and so I just wanted to get any response you've had, you hear to anything, anything you've heard or anything that you think should be raised at this point. Well, um, I think the World Health Organization should be raised because that is the body that attempts to pull all of the nations together when it comes to health care, health research, et cetera. Uh, what I observed, and I served as a delegate to the World Health Organization for more than eight years, representing the United States. So what I observed was that um, things were sometimes more related to resources um, I believe 25% of the WHO budget was was at that time being paid by the United States. And so the question is, to what extent do we allow differences in the availability of resources to influence uh, how we cooperate with each other? I think the, the United States has a basically a good reputation of working with others, but in recent years, it's become one more difficult, and I think certainly with our last president, it led to the suggestion that we pull out of the World Health Organization. I think that would be that would be very unfortunate, um, and hopefully it's not going to happen. But I, I think 
it is understanding, if you will, the extent to which we all have common concerns and common common needs and certainly the opportunity to work together with our neighbors in building a better world. So it's a challenge, but I think uh, I, I think uh, it is an example uh, of these common commitments that we have, even though they may not seem to be common at first. So I think it's quite relevant to this discussion that we're having here today. Yeah, Walter, let me just come to you because you are there as a substitute for Dr. Elders to see how, how well you do that job. But the, the, the main idea is that we earlier, <laughs> Dr. Sage is laughing because you can't really do that. But, but earlier we referenced D.C. General Hospital in the context of this broader statement on public sanitation. But also since you were doing that work right there in the city of Washington, that is the nation's capital, if you have anything you, you, uh, you'd like to say at this point. Right. I just want to uh, build, want to make the comment that uh, it sounds like we have consensus on building back better. And uh, <laughs> I think that that could result in us having a, a D.C. general capacity. But I think I just want to uh, support what the admiral was saying, because the security and logistics afforded by the military helped us in Ebola. And I'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Satcher in terms of how he sees uh, the military as helping us. Uh, with the pandemic as well. I don't think we could have done, had been as successful with the Ebola epidemic uh, without the military. Um, and, and in fact, we're still benefiting from that because of the public health infrastructure that was put in place so that the public health measures that they're using are doing a better job than we are in the US. But I wanna just uh, thank uh, Helga and Dr. Satch and Dr. Elders for their continue, all they do uh, for humanity and you've been the inspiration to all of us. And here in D.C., uh, Dr. Satcher, we use your 1997 uh, interest in and really support for faith-based agencies uh, in combating HIV and other problems. Um, that uh, resource combined with the uh, youth-focused community health workers, it really helped us here in D.C. As of today, we have 13 new cases, zero deaths. And for the past week, we've only had one from one to zero deaths per day. But I think that reflects what can be done, uh, you know, with that kind of collaboration. Um, and I just, my question for Dr. Satcher though is, how can we take what we've learned in terms of collaboration uh, to really uh, make this a worldwide uh, reality? Now we know it can be done, it's so good to hear uh, now that Russia's uh, got vaccines, and it's so much opportunity here now for us to do some collaboration. Uh, we've, we've been in contact with some of the uh, youth organizations in India and places around. So we, we do see some, some, some possibilities. So my question, though, to Dr. Satcher is, um, going forth, how can we utilize lessons learned uh, to replicate what success we've had here worldwide. It's so good to see you again. Thank you. Same here. Well, I think, I think it's an excellent example because it was, uh, it was actually President George W. Bush, whom I served on for my last year, I served under my last year in government. It was, uh, even though he was not the one who originally pushed supporting uh, the treatment of AIDS in Africa, he took it as a cause. He made funds available to make sure that uh, people in Africa would not be burdened with the disease that they could not afford to treat. So it was really under George W. Bush that the funds were made available to make sure that um, the treatment of, of AIDS uh, occurred throughout Africa without barriers based on the availability of funds. And I mean, he deserves probably more credit for that than he gets, because uh, it's made a big difference in AIDS in the world. I mean, in terms of the way we 
the, the availability of therapies for the treatment of HIV AIDS that uh, has prevented the continuing spread, and especially in Africa, prevented many, many deaths. Um, what we're but going to but be... I think... Sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Now finish your point, please. No, I, I was just going to say, I, I think... Um, uh, I think AIDS is a good example, a good example of working together. There are some other examples. I mean, smallpox we've talked about. Uh, the CDC, uh, again, up until maybe recently, has been viewed as the, the uh, most important agency globally for dealing with pandemics. And certainly that was true with smallpox and several others. But I think we've just got to get back to that sense of working together so here's what we'll do uh, because we've got we want to draw this part of our uh, discussion in a minute to a close we have mr miss chanoff we're going to kind of go to you i want to make sure we hear from general clegg and then helga's got her hand up so we'll do the three of you so mr miss chanoff go right ahead uh, yes uh, uh what i'd like to draw your attention to is uh, something that is also now high on the agenda in inter international organizations, uh, uh, which is complementary basically to um, uh, deploy medical uh, and broader sustainable uh, social or social infrastructure, is transfer of technologies. Uh, our country may be one of the first countries to uh, deploy uh, production of vaccines elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I think that this is uh, part of a big discussion that uh, this conference uh, could also contribute to. Uh, so would be interesting to, to hear uh, from uh, um, uh, distinguished experts uh, whether you see feasible this task of, of um, rapid transfer and technology to uh, develop to the developing world because it seems that we are not moving at the right, right pace to withstand uh, the scale of, of this of this disease. Uh, so probably new innovative innovative uh, efforts are needed. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. General Clegg, you haven't had a chance to say anything yet, anything you have to offer at the moment. General Clegg? <laughs> I think you're muted. Uh, all right. Okay. Um... You know, as to the feasibility of doing these things, uh, I think a good example is the way the world reacts to major disasters. We have lots of examples. In fact, every time there is a major disaster, um, many nations come together and uh, provide resources to deal with the problem. Just think back to uh, the, the typhoon in uh, in Ase in, in Indonesia, uh, which killed so many people. Um, I know we had at least an aircraft carrier over there um, and other nations contributed. So, so it's not as if this is something new that has not been done before. We have done it before. We do it all the time. It's just uh, when you put it in the medical arena alone, um, uh, it, it becomes an infrastructure problem and uh, one a problem of sustainability uh, because when you respond to a disaster, that's generally a one-time event. Everybody contributes something. We ameliorate the problem, then everybody goes home. Uh, what we need here is a sustained effort to develop those parts of the world which don't have uh, the infrastructure necessary essentially to solve their own problems. And so uh, what's necessary are solutions that enable those areas to 
obtain the infrastructure necessary for them to deal with these problems when they occur. Okay, thank you. Helga? Uh, I, I don't have a ready-made answer, but I have a, a question. I think it was the Admiral who, who talked about the need to set up some uh, document defining some uh, durable approach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, what is if one would say that after the summit between President Biden and President Putin, there was, you know, an establishment of a certain agreement that subjects would be discussed, like strategic stability, various other things. Uh, then yesterday at our conference, uh, we discussed that, you know, basically because of the history of the last 30 years between the United States and Russia, a lot of trust has been lost. You know, various people on both sides have said that the, histo the, the historic relation has never been so at a low point. I think it was <clears throat> uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov who said that repeatedly. So what is if one would think, is there in, either in the United Nations or in, on a bilateral level between the United States and Russia or a group of countries, including Russia and the United States, some mechanism either in the United Nations or in the WHO where one could say we put together a group of military who have the expertise to go into a place like a one-time response to a typhoon or disaster, but this time not just as a one-time event, but with the idea to build up a serious medical infrastructure to, to stay. You know, like building modern hospitals requires clean water, electricity, uh, <clears throat> you know, basic infrastructure. You have to start the mechanization of agriculture. You have to start a certain amount of industry. And if, let's say, as a measure of goodwill between the United States and Russia and other countries who would want to join, one would start these kinds of pilot projects both to address the pandemic, but also as a way to rebuild international relations, you know, to build trust. And if it cannot be done on a bilateral level, because there's all this history and, and all this burdens and baggage, but if both would say, we join our efforts to help those countries who are really in need and who will not make it without that the large countries come together and we make that the beginning of building a completely new paradigm among the relations. I think this would, this would solve several problems at the same time. It would start to build trust between the United States and Russia and other countries who would join. Um, it would address, you know, it would bring in the competence of the military because, you know, as it was said, you know, the, they are the most efficient organization. You could put together a core of engineers from many countries who would say, we take two countries on each continent, two in Africa, two in Latin America, two in Asia, or maybe four in Africa, and because they are in most need. And we start to seriously go about it as if we would reconstruct, you know, the, the United States, you know, we would take the same approach. Is there any way this could come out of this discussion? Because I think that would tell a signal to the world, which would great hope for, you know, that we really can change things. So let's go to Mark and see if he has something to say about that. Well, Helga, you, you mentioned one thing, and I, again, not being a health expert, but uh, one thing that was mentioned was technology. And I certainly have a background in that. Um, it seems to me that it, fundamental to having effective health systems is access to clean water. You know, if you if you want to look at the first step, I mean, I don't know how you put in place. I, I'm sure General Clegg would you know knows this very well. In the army, clean water probably right at the forefront of what you have to have 
to have a system that works and, and an army that moves and, and to have an effective healthcare system, access to clean water. So, you know, perhaps, perhaps on the technology side, uh, bilateral, trilateral, whatever, we have technologies, the distribution, the access to clean water as a priority to me might be a very effective first step. And, you know, we've got a lot of healthcare professionals here that uh, have a lot to say about that, I'm sure. But that's what I'm struck with. And I think, uh, you know, Russia, the United States, a number of other countries have unique access to technologies. Uh, this is not an issue that, uh, that should divide us. It's one that could actually bring us together. So access to clean water would be my first priority because how do you put a hospital in place if you don't have clean water? If people, how do you stop disease if they don't have access to clean water? So that's my thought. We're going to try to see if we can connect Dr. Elders. We can't get, bring her up on video. We're going to try audio. She's been listening for quite a while, but she's at another location where, she, where we're having a problem. So are we able to do that? We're trying that right now just to see if she, because this has been, is she muted? She has to unmute. Star six, Dr. Elders hit star six to unmute. Let's see what happens. Well, for, well, I'm unmuted, I understand. Yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Elders, I think we we have you now. Could you speak a little bit louder? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, Hold on, we need a little bit more volume from you. But I don't know how to say anything. Don't let me hold up. Ready? Go, go ahead. On. I'm All right. Well, we heard that much. She said, "Don't let me hold everything up." <laughs> Uh, she yeah. always talks about clean water. Okay. That's exactly why we were trying to get her in. What you were just saying, Mark, as okay. being, you know, you it can't, vaccines are one thing, but if you don't have clean, clean water and food, then this doesn't mean anything. In fact, Dr. Satcher, since you're the other Surgeon General that's present, I think it falls to you to maybe, in this case, try to speak for Dr. Elders. Father tried it. He did okay. But now it's your turn. I keep hearing Dr. Elders. Yeah, she's not. We're, 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 there's too much background noise. We're not able to really get her clearly. Yeah, I, I think it's important for, for us to be um, genuine with each other in this discussion. Um, we say clean water, and by which I hope we mean safe water. Um, because we have a problem, you know, in some of our own cities, and, and we, I guess, are the wealthiest, but uh, in some of our cities in this country, in our country right now, we have a problem making sure that people have access to safe water. Uh, and so we, we, we might as well put the problems all on the table if we're going to solve them. And I, I think it, it gets back to the whole purpose of this commission uh, until until people see the, the common elements of these problems. You might not, you know, live in a community where there's lead in the water, but it's all of our problem until we get it taken care of. And we have that problem in some of our communities. Uh, lead is very dangerous, uh, especially for children. And so we have to make sure that we have two things going here. This commitment to safe water uh, has to be a global commitment. And, um, and we all have to 
agree that it is it is our it is our problem whether it's in our community or in somebody else's community i hope that makes sense but certainly that's been that's been an issue in our country yeah i think what we should probably do i want to thank everybody i think what we're going to just pull this part to to a close because we have a lot more on this panel uh, and just Helga, if you, I, well, I'll just reference, you know, Lyndon LaRouche back in 1984 had a memorandum of understanding, I think he called it, a memorandum of agreement between the United States and then the USSR. And it sort of had this spelled out set of principles, of policies, of ideas. Uh, clearly, we were in the middle of the Cold War. You know, Ronald Reagan was president. Lyndon LaRouche had just proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative. But it was a draft memorandum, and it outlined a set of principles. And, and perhaps something like that, which is not necessarily even that long, could be done and could be uh, proposed by some of the persons on this, on this panel. Uh, Helga, I don't know if that, you might want to respond to that, and then we'll go back to our... Yeah, I think since the Admiral was uh, talking earlier about writing up some standardized document which would define this, you know, and then maybe the other panelists could somehow endorse it and we would start to discuss it. I would like to ask Mr. Me Mechanov, uh, if, uh, he could, if he could be tasked to explore what would be the right uh, venue. You know, would it be in the United Nations, some subgroup to put together such an effort, or would it be the WHO? Or what would be the kind of uh, framework where one could actually start such a thing, you know, with these, uh, you know, commitments from both countries and hopefully more countries? Would you accept such a task? <laughs> All right, Mark, sounds like you and Mr. Bishanov are on the spot. No, no, uh, I just, just wanted to, to, to give my voice of, of support. Uh, personally, uh, at least that would be great if, if we could uh, join our um, our efforts. And there is nothing better than than joining efforts and doing good. That that is obvious. Uh, if uh, we could uh, have uh, uh, more uh, stable and predictable uh, relations, which we are sort of trying to, 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 to gain momentum on, the, on that at uh, this, uh, this, um, this period, not at that fast speed that w would be desirable for, for, for our side at least, but uh, uh, I think we are uh, at, a, at a very important, um, in a, a very important phase now that could, we, we could speak of, of many th things, I think, there are, of course, uh, some priorities that our presidents uh, have discussed, uh, and um, probably we will need to, to see first how these priorities could be addressed in bilateral um, in a bilateral manner. Uh, and, and of course, at some uh, stage, uh, we, we could speak on, on joining efforts. Uh, because now uh, we, we see and we observe so many um, projects of cooperation with, with Africa, for example, we, we have seen so many summits between uh, France and Africa, China and Africa, Russia and Africa, Japan and Africa. You see, the, uh, all, all of them have to do also with the infrastructure and, and also medical infrastructure is part of them. But uh, we haven't yet seen any, any joint uh, effort uh, at this level. Uh, we, we have some mechanisms in the United Nations. They are called groups of friends, for example, which, which uh, um, provide a, a scene for, for informal discussions. This, this could be uh, uh, discussed uh, in group of friends of Africa, uh, group of friends of least developed countries, group of friends of health. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I would find myself in a difficult position to, to speak for, uh, for uh, Geneva, based organizations in WHO, but, but certainly there is a, a form of uh, inter-ambassadorial uh, dialogue uh, there, there as well. Uh, but when we come to, to uh, Russia and the United States, uh, 
joint efforts elsewhere in the world. I think we'll, we already speak on, on joint efforts in Arctica, for example. Uh, uh, in, some, in some regions we have spoken much on, on Syria. But that, but that is more about strategic stability. I would like to speak more, of course, and we, we all would, would love to, to, to speak more about uh, economic and social infrastructure building. But I think we, we, we first need, need to, to, to um, uh, succeed in, 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 in these uh, uh, issues of priority. I mean, uh, strategic stability is, is the key now. And, and of, course, of course, depending on that, we could move further. Okay. And I, and I don't think Mark is going to put up any kind of a fight because he's going to drag General Clegg in there with him. So that's not going to be a, that's going to be a problem. And, but just so no one gets left out without any work, this is directed to uh, Surgeon General Satcher. This comes from Bith, Bishop Jethro James, who was responding to your earlier question. He's from uh, a, a, a rather statement. He's a pastor from Newark. Uh, he's a chaplain for New Jersey State Police Departments, many other things. He says this, given the lack of a modern healthcare system and effective defense versus germ war warfare in many of America's formerly industrial cities, exemplified by the horrific situation of water contamination in Newark, New Jersey, Flint, and Detroit, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi, and other locations, what are the thoughts of panelists on a crash program to fully rebuild and modernize infrastructure in these cities, starting with their water systems? This should not be a piecemeal repair job, but comprehensive reconstruction. And then he goes on to answer his question. Based on panelists' experience of military efforts to build infrastructure quickly and the CDC experience of vaccinating 100 million people in India in one week, which we didn't actually get to, but that did happen, what do they think lessons are for what could be done now in our collapsed urban centers? This could be an opportunity for young people to be gainfully employed in building this infrastructure, as well as help lower the shockingly high rate of infant mortality, which is partially caused by unclean water. So, Dr. Satcher, that was directed in your direction, as you can tell, just to see what your response might be. Well, yeah, it was obviously more, more of a statement than a question, but it's a very important one. Um, okay. So... We can follow these things you know, up. I, I, I agree that we have we have to remain committed to the, the premise for which this organization was founded. That um, that we're all in this battle together, and uh, we have to we have to work together to solve problems. It's not their problem; it's our problem, and um, that that's the challenge I think that we face. All right, so Helga, I'm about to Dennis, close this. Oh, wait a minute, Doc so Walter's in there. Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, you know, uh, Mozambique may be a, a good project uh, for us to look at as really addressing some of these issues, water especially. Uh, you know, things are in motion, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Lang would be very interested in how we could get this kind of support. Uh, as an honorary Liberian citizen, uh, I know uh, folks in Liberia would be very interested in having this kind of effort as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the military was really instrumental in assuring the success of Ebola. So I think there's something uh, that we can build on there. Okay, very good. So Helga, I wanna, do you have anything else that you'd like to say at this point, now that you put everybody to work? <clears throat> no, but I think some of the ideas are percolating, you know, clean water would be a project, you know, where the military could play a very important role. And uh, I would suggest that uh, since we can now discuss this out, that we organize another phone call in the next uh, week to, to, to discuss it more concretely, what can be explored. Okay, very good. So I want to thank uh, Councilor Mischanov, Dr. Walter Faggett, Admiral Peleus, General Clegg, and of course, Surgeon General Satcher, for this portion of the discussion. We're going to now resume our uh, scheduled broadcast, as they say. So thank you. We're next going to hear from Dr. Khadija Lang, who actually was connected, but unfortunately, because of some of the technical problems we're dealing with here, we can't bring everybody in at the same time. I haven't been able to do that. Um, but Dr. Khadija Lang, the chairman of the National Medical Association Council on International Affairs, 
uh, and Marsha Mary Baker, the editorial board of Executive Intelligence Review, and their presenta- presentation is actually about Mozambique, Mozambique Pilot Aid Shipment, Action Diplomacy for World Health Security. Asia Lang, and I'm the chair of the National Medical Association's Region 6, as well as the chair of their Council on International Affairs and chair of Alpha Gamma Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated's Global Income Impact Committee. I'm a board certified family medicine physician and president of Golden State Medical Association, the California branch of the National Medical Association. Golden State Medical Association began conducting medical missions to the Southeast African nation of Mozambique in 2015 due to the paucity of medical resources and providers in that country. We started out by bringing medical supplies to the country and then brought physicians and surgeons here for med- there for medical missions. Our physicians uh, teams worked closely with the physicians in Mozambique, providing professional development medical missions in which we trained them on how to safely perform more complex procedures and shared ways to manage more complex cases that they had pre-selected prior to our arrival. By exchanging this information, we not only helped to elevate the level of health care provided there, but also ensured sustainability of our missions and ongoing care for their citizens uh, in this country, even after we returned home. However, during the last year, Mozambique has been hit with a trifecta of natural and man-made calamities. It started with locust plagues of biblical proportions, was followed by back-to-back cyclones inundating the now barren fields left by the locust and bringing cholera as well as increasing the existing malaria problem there. And then came COVID with its lockdown, further food shortages, job losses, and generalized destruction to the region. This natural downturning of the people's condition has recently been further devastated by terrorist attacks that have caused the numbers of refugees there to swell to over 1 million now with a predominance of women and children victims. Golden State Medical Association and the National Medical Association's Council on International Affairs have been partnering over the years with the Alpha Gamma Omega Chapters Global Impact Committee to provide medical supplies, eyeglasses, shoes, and clothes for the citizens of this impoverished nation. And when faced with the current situation, we knew that we had to do more. As a physician, I know that performing surgery on a patient who is malnourished is not as likely to be successful and can often have very poor outcomes despite performing the surgery correctly. For optimal surgical results, patients need a certain minimal nutritional status and the current famines and starvation that are spreading throughout the countryside now rob the patients of the opportunity to truly benefit from our work. For our work to have maximal impact, we recognize that we now must also address their nutritional status. Due to this realization, we were introduced to the Schiller Institute and their coincidence of opposites, which matches our mission and goals so ideally, we knew that this was a hand and glove fit. This partnership has allowed us to work with people of like minds as we expand and enhance our work in Mozambique. Our collaboration with their farmers and other partners is making it possible to secure and provide the necessary food to mitigate the starvation that is happening now, without which our medical interventions are not likely to have a significant impact. Medical donations and food donations have already started coming in as a result of our collaboration. And we don't want the prohibitive cost of shipping to limit how much of this we can get over there to these people that are in such great need. We plan to get the first shipment out within a matter of weeks 
And so any donations that you can make to help us with the shipping costs and to purchase more food once we arrive there will be most welcome and really help us to make a difference and a true global impact for the refugees in Mozambique. And so I would like to turn the stage over now to one of our partners, Ms. Marcia Mary Baker and she will be able to give you more information on that important component of feeding the famine and starving so that we are not trying to do medical treatment on a corpse. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I hope that you will be encouraged to join us in our fundraiser and food and medicine drive that we launched for World Refugee Day and contribute so that we will be able to get the medicines and foods that these people need to them in a timely fashion and prevent this from becoming something like the devastation and terrible things we saw during the refugees, excuse me, during the uh, famines in Ethiopia 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lang. I will add just a point of context about our committee's team effort in Mozambique. This pilot project is an act of policy diplomacy, making clear that the basics to sustain life were already in short supply, under supply, before the pandemic. Both medical and non-medical basics like food and water and power so shocks like a virus turning into a pandemic were to be expected for a long time. And look at another shock. Pending right now is a food shock. The world grain harvest in recent years has been dropping per capita. Overall, we produce less than 3 billion tons a year of cereal grains of all kinds, and it should be over 5 billion tons. And before the pandemic, we had 800 million people already going hungry. That number has increased. And within that number, over 40 million are at the point of potential starvation this year. Now, if you, in you look at a map of the drought in North America, that's very bad right now, it's in the Southwest, and it's hitting California farming. But besides that, it's hitting to the uh, central states and that's the corn belt of the world. Now, if you look at the world map of corn, the area now getting hit in, the, in North America by the drought accounts for one third of the total world harvest of corn, the annual production. So any disaster in North America, and I'm not saying it will hurt the corn crop, it's already stressed, will automatically be a world disaster. So this kind of vulnerability and concentration of production in one part of the world while another part of the world, especially in Africa has famine, this is the result of the monopoly transnational system of big food cartels, which is a wing of Wall Street in London. It should never have been allowed to happen. Already, in fact, in May, food prices were 38% higher than May in 2020, mostly from the big bailouts and hyperinflation associated with Wall Street in London. So the point is, it's no policy at all in the world to just hope and pray that shocks don't happen that no virus turns into a pandemic, that no bad weather creates a famine. And we won't even discuss the green assault on the means to life, the way food is being cut, water is being cut, and that's proposed as nature-based solutions. No, so the point of our mobilizing for a world health security system by the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites is regarding all respects of necessities of life. So when you look at what's being assembled to go to Mozambique within a couple weeks, like the emergency rations of food, what you see, these are produced in Louisiana from US grown crops. 
And these emergency rations are familiar. They were developed for maritime disasters and they're used by the World Food Program. So our initiative in Mozambique signifies mobilization at large in the world. The shipment has medicine, the shipment has additional resources for food within Mozambique and water purification tablets, which signifies we need big water infrastructure as soon as possible. So we call on you to join with the committee for the coincidence of opposites everywhere. And I'm very glad with the Schiller Institute to be working with Dr. Lang and the others here and abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. And what we're gonna do now is bring both Dr. Lang uh, and Marcia Baker up on the uh, screen to discuss this a bit, as well as uh, Helga. So if we can, ah, there you are. All right, so a few things. Uh, clearly the Mozambique project has been one that has been critical in uh, what the work of the committee for the coincidence of opposites is. And maybe Dr. Lang will go to you first and just let, let people know a bit of, of, of why you were involved in that nation in particular and what you think at this point the importance of this project will be uh, given what has now emerged as a rise in and surge in the Delta virus and other conditions in Southern Africa as a whole. Uh, well, good afternoon, all. As I said earlier, we began, Golden State Medical Association began our relationship with Mozambique due to information we received from associates as to the paucity of healthcare providers in Mozambique. And when we heard how few physicians and healthcare providers they actually had in such a populous country, we were planning to do some medical missions in a different country in Africa. But when we heard how significant the problem was over there, we changed our plans and started looking into going to Mozambique to provide these medical services instead of our originally planned country. As a result of that, we got there and we saw for ourselves how things were, and we decided that there was a lot we could do here. We started out just by bringing medications, things that we took for granted, uh, and, and doing educational lectures. And then we followed that up by saying, well, Let's come in and do work as, as clinicians, actual uh, healthcare work. We did that, uh, found that the people were very receptive of it. It seemed to benefit their healthcare in general. And so we continued uh, with that and came back with an actual professional development medical mission. And I specify professional development because the purpose and goal of our going there was not to see if we could treat 10,000 people in a week. Our purpose was to make a sustainable impact on their healthcare system. And so what we did was we worked through their ambassador who connected us with their Ministry of Health and then worked with their uh, national director and people like that so that we could find out what were the needs that they saw as important. We didn't want to just go in there saying, we think you need help with this and this. And so that's what we're going to do. We wanted to know what did their healthcare providers, the few that were there, feel was important for them to get some assistance with. And so we followed a lead set by their Ministry of Health and the physicians there at public hospitals that they selected. Once that was done, they selected cases that were complex, that they did not know how to handle themselves which would either not be done at all and the patient would just be left to suffer and in some cases uh, demise from a condition that was not treatable where they were, or the patient would have to find the means to go to another country to get the procedures done. What we did on our professional development missions was to go over there and say, okay, get your most complex patients together. We're going to be there on this date have them already cleared and ready for surgery. And so when we land on Sunday, we're in the operating room on Monday doing cases and teaching them what is it that's necessary to be successful in the more complex cases 
that they would not dare to touch prior to that. In this manner, once we leave, I think, I'm not sure if I'm freezing, but in this manner, once our mission, which is temporary, um, we're all volunteers that leave our practices here to go and do that. When that time period ends and we return back to the States, the physicians that are left there who are their regular doctors, they now know how to do it because we have taught them what they need to know to be able to do those more complex procedures successfully and transfer that knowledge to them. They in turn transfer knowledge to us when we're seeing how do you work in a situation that is so stripped of what we would consider the bare necessities of practicing medicine? How do you work when you don't have things that we would not even open up the operating room without? And there they go through the full operation without having some of the resources we take for granted over here. And so we learned from them, it was a mutual uh, professional exchange. But most importantly, when we left there, those things that they, those cases that they were not able to do before, they're now able to do them on their own without us being there. And so patients don't have to wait for us to come again next year um, or the year after, as, as the case may be with the pandemic, because we could not go last year because of the pandemic. And if we had not taught those physicians how to do those things, the people that had those recurring conditions would still not have gotten that relief. And, and now, as I said, with all of the devastation that's coming to the country through a combination of predominantly natural, but also man-made incidents, we're, we're, we're seeing that what was previously a country that was, had a poor access to healthcare has now been completely compounded by famine and starvation. And if you do surgery on a patient who doesn't have good skin tissue, the, the stitches aren't going to hold. The cuts are going to break open. Nothing that you do is going to have the impact you really want it to have because the patient you're operating on doesn't have that basic nutritional status to allow the body to go through the healing processes. So this is why we realize that it's so important if we're going to have an impact on the health over there and the patients and, and the population is going through a famine and starvation, we have to be working together to say, in addition to bringing a, a higher level of knowledge of healthcare information and procedural methods, we've got to first make sure that the patient's body is in physical condition that's able to benefit from the work we're doing and feeding them and preventing starvation and getting their bodies into a nutritional status that will allow them to be able to respond and heal is imperative if what we're going to do is going to have an impact. Marsha, David Beasley of the World Health Organization has just been in Mozambique. I think he just opened up an office there. Uh, but he had been emphasizing something which Helga has said many times about the hundreds of millions of people actually immediately in, in jeopardy because of famine. You've been doing a lot of work, of course, over the years uh, following what's going on in food and, uh, uh, and famine questions all over the world. Maybe you should comment here and then we'll go to Helga. Yes, you're right. It was June 15, I think, that a new... Uh, office of the World Food Program was opened in Maputo and David Beasley flew there in person and met with the Minister of Agriculture there because unfortunately so many people uh, are in need, close to 2 million people out of 30 million people in Mozambique of food relief just to continue to exist that this special effort has been made. He also went to Madagascar where the drought is terrible and I just will add to this picture uh, just a couple of factoids because it's um, after Dr. Elders and Helga Zeplarouche convened last summer, that is tw June 2020, the 
effort for a committee for the coincidence of opposites and informal meetings were held over the months, you could see that the initiative, um, there was a continuity of friendship and a continuity init of initiative that Dr. Lang just described between the uh, National Medical Association and other and collaborators in Mozambique. But with the COVID, we're in a whole world situation that demands action. How many, maybe f close to 4 million people have died, many more that are, are not in the official figures of the pandemic. But you know, in 2020, I think 11 million people died of starvation. It had already had an annual toll of nine, eight, nine million. And David Beasley uh, and others in the World Food Relief picture said just a few days ago, 41 million people internationally are at uh, the door of famine out of hundreds of millions who are food insecure. These people are desperate. So if you look at the picture, on the other hand, of farmers in some of the most productive parts of the world, Australia, France, Argentina, the US, India, have been on the streets uh, or otherwise protesting for the leeway and ability to continue to produce food. And you take these figures I just gave of the people who lack food. That's the point about the work that we, the commitment that we have to fulfill. And I, that's just the picture in which we are acting and conducting this particular piece of action diplomacy, we call it in Mozambique. Unfortunately, you could be doing it everywhere. We have continuity there, but that's the point. We are going to make a difference everywhere. Helga, you have anything that you'd like to say at this point in response to Dr. Lang or Marsha? Well, I think we have to make sure the whole world uh, knows much more about the actual conditions in Mozambique, in Yemen, in Syria, and in many other countries, because the mainstream media are not covering the extent of what Dr. Beasley calls a crisis of biblical dimension. And since most people are fundamentally good, if they would know about it, this present supposed indifferentism uh, would vanish. Because once people actually see that it's real human beings, real babies, real children, real old people, you know, in these conditions, you know, empathy would develop. And I, I believe that we have reached a point in history where our morality, our fitness to survive is being tested. Because, you know, when you are confronted with such a double crisis of a pandemic and a famine, you know, you have to change something. And we know perfectly well that our efforts with the committee, um, you know, we are a small, hopefully quickly growing private organization, and we cannot do what needs to be done by the governments of this world. But we want to encourage with our example, you know, action on a large scale. So our hope would be that the committee idea spreads to many countries, that more people are joining, because I think, you know, the idea of a world health system is an idea whose time has come. And I think it could become the turning point for the whole history of humanity. So I'm calling on all our viewers, that is you, uh, to join this effort. I think we may have a uh, question on the line from Dr. Ernest Johnson. Is he actually with us there? He is the President Emeritus of the Louisiana NAACP and a member of their national board. Is, there, is he uh, with us? Okay, we're just trying to do that. Okay, we may not be able to get him in for that question. We'll try it a little bit later than if we can't get him now. Uh, so, Dr. Lang, you have any response to either what Helga said or any other thoughts? No, you have a limited. I, I think Helga was right. I think that as a rule, I think people, the majority of people are good by nature. The problem is that we have so many people who are not doing bad by commission, but bad by omission. And so it's when we do nothing 
well, they say the only way for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. When we do nothing out of ignorance, because we're unaware of the fact that the evil is taking place, it doesn't change the fact that we've done nothing. And I think those of us that have been able to get the information and become aware of what's going on have to try to get the word out to others so that they can become aware of what is happening, become aware of the needs. When we tell people that, you know, you may spend $25, $30 a week at Starbucks just with your morning fix of coffee and a muffin and with that $30 a week, we could get a family of four fed for a month in Mozambique. But we've got to get to collect, get somebody to say, I'm going to take that money and not give it to Starbucks this week. I'm not trying to make anybody go out of business over here. But just, you know, if everybody were to say, for one week, I'll give up some simpleness, not go hungry. Just give some simpleness up so that another family across the world that does not have access to that can survive. Not so they can eat steak and lobster, so they can sur just survive. Because what we're talking about here is helping. We're trying to sustain people's lives until such time as something better and more powerful and more organized can get there and take it over and help them to get reestablished of supporting their own food needs as they have done in the past. But they have to have something to hold on to while they're building themselves back up and reestablishing. And so when people donate and take a small amount of their routine spending habits and set it aside to help with something like this, they make a huge difference and everyone adds up and, and counts. All right, very good. I think we might have Dr. Faget wanted to say something. If is, is he on the line? There he is. I, you've got to unmute you. Hold on. Hi, can you? Great. Hi, great how jobs. are you doing? Just great. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of interest here in D.C. We've had good success uh, mobilizing youth. In fact, the city has taken over the whole community health worker kind of concept. We now have community support workers going door to door. Uh, but uh, Dr. Elders uh, was encouraging us to reach out to the youth. Uh, so we have some uh, coalition formed with uh, youth in other countries. Uh, I do know that you uh, will have students, medical students, uh, dental students, and people like that with you. Uh, have any connections been made yet with the youth in Mozambique? Um, is there any uh, possibility that we could help uh, establish that. Uh, the efforts to mobilize on, the youth. Just, just a moment, just a moment. Let me just put something in here, which we may as which will help because it's also another. It's a question that was asked to some by to to us uh, by Daniel Burke, member of the Shiller Institute for ten years. He says, yeah. "My question to the panelists is: What can be done to fulfill the goal, getting us in drawing together youth organizations from many nations in a process right. of dialogue and collaboration?" as many parties have come here together today. Every young person deserves to understand the method of Nicholas of Cusa, the coincidence of opposites. It will make all the difference. Thank you for everything you've done for mankind and for your respective nations. So I just wanted to interpolate that. And, 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 Dennis, and let me make a point here, Dennis. You mentioned in the earlier panel that what they're doing in Mexico instead of bringing into curriculum, that is one way. But what we're finding in D.C. is having them directly involved in the health fairs, hands-on kind of stuff. Uh, you have uh, a lot more. In fact, um, if indeed it looks like it's a uh, governmental or health agency run kind of project, then it's less attractive to the youth. So uh, approach here is important. But I, I uh, Khadija, I'm sorry. Did you have an answer? Uh, well, I, I was just going to say, unfortunately, we when we first went uh, on a couple of our missions, <laughs> We have actually taken young people here from the states to overseas with us so that they can be exposed and they found it life-changing experiences. Uh, one young man went and his younger sister, as a result of seeing what this young man had done, decided she wanted to get involved too, even though she had not gone. 
And so she was able to organize a mission with assistance from the National Medical Association's Council of International Affairs. She was able to organize a mission to Ghana for malaria prevention with homeless women and children and got some support from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated's uh, Global Impact, uh, excuse me, the Alpha Gamma Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority's Global Impact Committee uh, for that. And we helped her organize and get that done. It was very successful. Our earlier efforts had started getting young people involved. And when COVID hit, uh, that put everything to a stop. Now that they are trying to get things back open up again, we're going to be able to start reaching out to the young people again. But we did work with the residents over there. We did lectures for the residents, uh, medical residents, uh, which is the new physicians coming out so that we could help spread knowledge with them and teach them some things they hadn't heard yet. And so we did work with the young people over there with respect to the new doctors coming out, but not so much the young people say in their 15 to 25 age range, we have not been able to complete reaching them at this point, but we are working on that as well as looking forward to bringing young people from here over there when we go again. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna Thank you for the question, Dr. Beckett. Sure. We're going to pull this section to a close as well. So Helga, you have anything that you'd like to say before we transition? No, it's just that I think that, you know, now because of the pandemic, it's not possible. But I think that any young person who is not morally dried out already goes to Africa or Latin America to some of these really very difficult places, comes back with a life changed perspective. I can only, it happened to me, you know, it happened to me in, in 71. Um, and it has changed my life because once you recognize that it's not it's not a normal condition that so many billions of people should not have the potential life they could have. And now with the pandemic, everything has become so much worse. So I think we have to, you know, we have to really make sure that this incredible indifference, which has befallen many, many people in the so-called advanced countries, which are not so advanced, anymore at all, that we remedy that because this is a moral deficiency, you know, which is as bad as to die early because your soul dies. So I think, you know, this is an incredible moment. It can become a renaissance. And that's what we have to make sure that actually happens. But it does require people who, who really become active and act on this principle of the coincidence of opposites. Deja Lang, Marcia. And Helga, thanks a lot for this. We're going to now continue. Speaking of uh, the Central America, South America area, we have a greeting to our conference from Mayor David Castro of Honduras. Uh, he's the president of a thing called Mayors Without Borders. It's a Mayors Without Borders coalition. And I just want to point out that uh, in the last few weeks, uh, that group of mayors is considering in what way they might form their own uh, Committee of Coincidence of Opposites, and we are encouraging that kind of project for every other nation. And if you know people in other nations, or if you yourself are watching this broadcast from uh, wherever you may be, please consider uh, working with us in that capacity. And so his uh, talk is just a greetings to the conference, and we're going to play that now. Muy buenos días, un gusto saludarles. Mi nombre es David Castro Suárez. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to send you my greetings. My name is David Castro Suárez, President of the Association of Mayors of Honduras and President of the Association of Mayors Without Borders. Today I'd like to greet all of the participants in this great conference, which is providing an example of humanity, an example of compassion, and above all is breaking through borders. Today, what you are discussing about a world of equality for all, I want to tell you that we Hondurans are also thinking the same, that there should no longer be barriers, 
that there should no longer be differences among social classes, because these natural phenomena, or this pandemic, or this plandemic, that is spreading globally, is making us see ourselves for what we really are, vulnerable human beings who are dying every day because we aren't prepared to combat what we ourselves have created. Hoy desde Honduras quiero decirles a ustedes que nos están viendo. Today, from Honduras, I want to tell you, those who are watching and listening, that mankind needs that commitment to help our fellow man, that commitment to help the most needy, because a plane is useless, a skyscraper is useless, a bridge is useless, a horse and a burro are useless if there are no human beings. This pandemic has changed our lives. It has changed the way we interact with the world. Furthermore, this pandemic has left a lot of death, a lot of calamities, and it has exposed many things. The question I ask myself, and I ask all of those who are listening to me is, what's going to happen with education? What will happen with the infrastructure projects? What will happen with the job creation projects? What's going to happen with humanity when this has passed? We human beings also have to start thinking about how we are going to rearrange things after this great lesson which God is giving us. Ustedes que están pensando en el bien común y en un mundo sin fronteras. You who are thinking about the common good in a world without borders, in a world without barriers, in a world without distinctions among social classes, are facing a great challenge, a great challenge which all of us join, and we join as workers, not as spectators. And that is why, on behalf of the Association of Mayors and Mayors Without Borders of my country, Honduras, I congratulate you, I encourage you to keep up the good work, and I say to you that you have in us a country that will welcome you with open arms. And that we are willing to keep working with the Schiller Institute and with this association or this organization that is thinking about globalization in a better world, about a country without borders, a municipality without barriers, a state with the definite participation of the citizenry. Felicidades, Dios les bendiga, y sigamos adelante. Congratulations. God bless you, and let's keep moving forward. May this conference that you are holding these two days be of great benefit for the whole world. Blessings to you. Thank you very much, Mayor Castro, the president of the Mayors Without Borders Coalition. This is going to be a transition, not in our conference, but perhaps in your thinking. 19 20, uh, 2020 was to be the year of Beethoven, the 250th anniversary of the composer's birth, partially because of the coronavirus pandemic, that group of celebrations has been extended to this year. The method of thinking that Beethoven brought to his compositions was a method of internal struggle. You can think about it almost as, a, as transcending physical violence in favor of intellectual struggle which is what was expressed particularly in what he did in his compositions in a way that, is, that is, seems to be audible, almost as though the musician, the composer, is speaking to us. And of course, in the famous Ninth Symphony, he did. He used the words of the poet Friedrich Schiller, who is the inspiration for this organization. And what we're going to do now is to be, present that method of the thinking of the coincidence of opposites as exemplified in musical composition. And to do that, Diane Sayre, candidate for United States Senate in New York and founder of the Schiller Institute New York City Chorus, has a presentation called E Pluribus Unum, What We Can Learn from Beethoven. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Helga, for convening this incredible conference. What I am going to share with you today is my delight at the extraordinary genius of Ludwig van Beethoven and his understanding of the human mind. 
This also, of course, reflects my own thoughts on the question of the importance of choruses and orchestras and even brass quintets for normal socialization and the development of human beings' creativity. I will also assert that apart from manipulations by satanic British scumbags and their fellow travelers, humanity actually is and can be very unified. And the key to unity is the diversity, but not in an affected or false way, uh, but actual uniqueness of each human being, which is truly a strength enriching the whole so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and the parts are each still distinct and unique. So how does this work? That's what we're going to examine in a very shorthanded sort of way, but I think it will become very clear because as Socrates insisted, I am only trying to cause you to become conscious of something that you already know. So we're going to start with this. That's barroom noise. Could you understand what people were saying? Probably not, but it's a good number of people. Now I'm going to have you listen to something else related, but a little more advanced. So thanks to my labeling, you saw that that was Mahler's Second Symphony, but it wasn't actually. It was the orchestra and audience getting ready for a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony, which has a very big orchestra, and you could hear them in the background. You could hear the people talking. Now, imagine I said, I'd like to take this crowd, and maybe it's a thousand people in that hall. Um, we don't want to have a thousand separate voices, but maybe we want to have... I don't know, an eight part chorus and a full orchestra. And that's about 27 or 28 different parts. Uh, and I'm gonna ask them to recite a poem. How might we do that? Well, I'll let's try our first hypothesis. This is that, but minus the orchestra. So you could understand what people were saying, but that wasn't exactly poetic and it'd be a little hard to get across anything that was particularly nuanced. Uh, but what are some factors that might allow us to hear 26 or 28 or 30 different types? And when I say voice, I mean not only the human singing voice, but also the voices of the instruments. Uh, time is a factor. That is, if everyone is speaking and singing and playing on their own, whatever, arbitrary schedule, that might sound something like the bar room or that warm up we heard before the Mahler Second Symphony. But if people speak in unison, like the mic check, even though everyone there probably didn't have the same voice type even when they were yelling, you actually were able to make out the words. So um, is that how they're going to do it? Um, and what happens when you add the instruments? Do you just speak in unison and have the instruments play really softly to accompany them? How would you actually solve this problem? Now, John Seegerson gave me a great recommendation for one approach to this. Um, and I was going to have you listen to each part separately, but I think that you probably don't want to do that. So we're just going to listen to a, a composition, which is a psalm, it's in English, and it's set to music for a four voice chorus and organ 
and handbells. So this is definitely not 26 different voices. If you count the, generously count the organ as four voices, which is not really a stretch because it's mimicking perhaps a, a chorus and the four voices of the chorus and the handbells, then you get nine. So let's see what Charles Ives does with nine voices. Does this help us get across a poem? And is it beautiful? Okay, well, I think that's enough. Um, the words were very clear in the unison part, and when he went to non-unison, that is the part split, you may have noticed that the voices, even you, though you had soprano, alto, tenor, bass, the voices only had two separate entrances. So it really was not four voices, it was two. And however, I'm afraid I had the feeling that if we added much more to that, it would really start to sound like the bar room or the warm up. So was it beautiful? You wanna to listen to it again? Probably not. Would you like it played at your wedding? I sure would not, um, unless I wasn't planning to stay married very long. So, Let's see what they tell us about this great composer, Charles Ives. For all his singularity, the Yankee maverick Charles Ives is among the most representative of American artists. Optimistic, idealistic, fiercely democratic, he unified the voice of the American people, because they all sang in unison, uh, with the forms and traditions of European classical music. That's a stretch. The way in which Ives pursued his goal of a democratic art and his career of creating at the highest level of ambition while making a fortune in the life insurance business perhaps could only have happened in the United States. And perhaps there could only there could such an isolated paradoxical figure make himself into a major artist. Okay. That's their opinion. Well, I think that he probably wrote his music in the same way that he sold his life insurance policies, and it was in the 20s leading into the crash of the stock market, so you might imagine what he did. Now, I'd like us to look at what Mr. Beethoven does in the Missa Solemnis now that we have a little bit of an idea of some of the challenges that a composer might face when doing something like this. First of all, let's take a look at the words that Beethoven is dealing with. Uh, slightly more complicated than what Charles Ives was dealing with. Credo in spiritum sanctum 
Dominum et vivificantum qui ex patre filioque procedit. Qui cum patre et filio, you get the idea. Uh, not exactly the simplest text. Now, you might argue correctly that a lot of people in that time knew the words to the Latin mass, but I would argue that they still had to be able to make out something of it to know where they were and what was being said. Just so you know in English what the words mean. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, as it was told by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I await the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So try and remember uh, those words and what it means. Now, let's look at the first page of the score so we can see how many voices Beethoven is going to be uh, giving us here. All right, so this is just the top half of the score. And if you count the flutes, one, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, horns one and two, horns three and four, trumpets, two trumpets, timpani, violin one, that's one violin playing two notes at once, violin two and viola. So you can count 17 voices here. And in the bottom half of the page, we can count 11 more voices uh, we're just going to count the, here we're going to count the organ as one, although you can see it might even be really six or eight, but we're going to count it as one. We haven't even counted the three trombones at all who come in later, uh, but just modestly we'll say 11. So 17 and 11 is 28 voices. Now, um, I think we should look at the score because you already have a hint. This is the Kyrie, it's the beginning. We're going to listen to part of the Credo. Does Beethoven do what Ives did? He's got 28 voices, so you would think maybe the most clear thing would be to have them all playing in unison, or at least at the same time, which it looks sort of like they're doing here. Here's the Credo. So, and this is starting at measure 264. Um, now, you see here is the lower voices, the cello, the organ, the cello, and the double bass. And here is the alto voice coming in, and then the bass voice comes in, and then, oops, the soprano voice comes in singing different words. And, uh, and then the tenor comes in. So not only are they entering at completely different times, these, these vertical lines are the bar lines, so this is where you are in time. They come in at different times, they're not even singing the same words. Now, do you think it really sounds different? I think that's what we're going to investigate. So let's go here and we're going to listen to the sopranos, and I'm gonna have you listen to the sopranos in this section all the way through, just to get the idea. This is our chorus, and what makes it even more miraculous is you will hear that it clearly is a chorus, um, and it's not even as precise as it would be if we'd been able to get together, but uh, here we go. So let's take a listen, and you can follow along on the score.
three, four, Okay, uh, so we get the idea of the soprano part, and I hope you noticed where some of these rests are. Now let's go to the alto here for a second. And just so you hear a little bit, I'm not going to play much of this, but the different quality of the voice type. So that's enough. I think you can hear that it is different. It's very different from the soprano, the soprano part. Let's see, we can go on and hear the tenors. And we're going to listen to a bit more of the tenor part. And again, you can hear this is more than one person singing. It's a section of voices. No. Bunch of rest they have, unlike the sopranos. And the altos, I think, had three measures there. You can hear the metronome. In credo, 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 credo. So I don't know if you remember the way the soprano started it, but they started it with this second theme over here. The tenors come in with this. Okay, and we're going to go on and just listen to a little bit of the bass. Here is part of the bass part again, and the, these parts are difficult. You will hear actually that we can do still a lot of cleanup on the pitches, but we're going to hear this whole thing put together. Um, and you can hypothesize and imagine in your mind what it might sound like with all these different parts. Uh, but here we go. Here's the bass. No.
you hear, I hope that this is again very different. Uh, now we're going to hear a little bit of the orchestra. I'm just doing a sample. We're not going to listen to all 26 or 28, 28 different parts. I just want to convince you that I'm not playing any tricks and these parts actually are all different. This is going to be the first violin part and I will let you listen to a little bit more of this. So I hope you hear that this is actually very different, yet again, than what the voices are doing. Now going to go on to the first bassoon part. <laughs> So uh, I hope you heard what I was speaking about, that each voice is truly unique in the quality of sound, in the melody they're playing. And Beethoven is very tricky in this because even within one voice, the following of the particular pitches, don't they don't always seem very comprehensible. Um, so you can imagine in your mind, how on earth is this all going to come together? And what you saw was uh, a little hint of a quote from the first biographer of Johann Sebastian Bach, which I think really expresses exactly what, what is going on here. Uh, he writes, so long as the language of music has only simple melodies, or only successive connection of musical tones, it must still be considered poor. Very different is the case when two melodies are so interwoven with each other that they, as it were, converse together, like two persons of the same rank and equally well informed. This sort of union of two melodies gives rise to new combinations of tones and consequently to an increase in the variety of musical expressions. When more voices are added and interwoven with each in the same free and independent manner, the wealth of musical expression increases still further. So I think that is very accurate. Uh, that the more complex in the hands of a genius like Beethoven, the more complex, the more voices come in, the more new 
voices and new ideas emerge from the interrelationship of them. So you get a multiplication, uh, an enhancement of even what you think is there. So what does this have to do with what we are discussing today? The coincidence of opposites and how do we unify mankind? Well, I think the first step is that mankind has to embark on a noble mission, on a great cause, and that each one of us has a unique talent to contribute to this. And I believe that people of goodwill, which I know is the majority of the human race, will pull in the same direction for a cause. We have fundamental questions before us. Millions of people are facing death through starvation, through disease, or war, or man-human-imposed sanctions. Do people believe that human beings should have food, should have meaningful jobs? Other than Barack Obama and the Bush family, do your neighbors actually want to send drones to kill children at weddings and funerals? There are truly inalienable rights which are already written in our souls. And therefore, contrary to the efforts of Hollywood and Wall Street sex perverts and the behavior modifiers of the British Empire, if we speak boldly and truthfully, I believe that we will discover that our nation and the human race is actually much more unified than we appear. But a noble mission, like a noble composition of Beethoven, is required to make this unity evident. Thank you.
So what can we learn from Beethoven, and what does this have to do with the coincidence of opposites? We've heard Diane's presentation. There are already many responses to it. But to discuss Beethoven, the Beethoven year, and thinking like Beethoven, we're going to bring Diane up and Helga. So here we are. So um, there are several reactions. Uh, someone of your fans, Diane, has said the presentation was awesome. That's the way that they put it. Um, and some other people are very moved by the fact of the shift that we've suddenly apparently made in the discussion process. I would argue it's not really a shift, but I'd like to just get uh, you to say something about why you did what you did and why, for you, this is so essentially the core of what the Schiller Institute and your own work, including your uh, political campaign, represent. Well, uh, I mean, Helga has been talking about this coincidence of opposites for some time, and I was thinking of really what a miracle it is when you hear a composition, and I didn't fully develop it, but uh, what I think is somewhat miraculous is you heard how rather um, disunified our sections were, but nonetheless, uh, even with those difficulties, which are due largely to having to rehearse separately and record separately in little cubicles, you can get a profound effect from the composition as a whole. And I, what I've been finding in the organizing that I'm doing is that the population, I think the population is largely anguished. We've heard from many of the speakers today about the violence, about the poverty, about the danger we face uh, because of a lack of certain agreement on the strategic level between governments. Uh, but fundamentally, we are each human and we have a mind, as I think Megan really discussed in the panels yesterday, which is capable of transforming our species. So I think it's from that standpoint of the human mind and having a mission, which is a transformation of the species to a higher level in a sense that is, um, which is the same thing as being part of a great composition. I mean, every single person we didn't get to see, we had to have a virtual orchestra, but imagine seeing an orchestra with 24 different you know, first violinist, if you had a really big orchestra. Every single person, nonetheless, has a crucial role and their creativity is valued. And you're not asking people to give that up for them to participate in doing something which is even greater than they are. And I think that's that's really what I was thinking about, and I'm hoping that it came across. Your response to the uh, killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island uh, was to create the chorus, uh, Schiller Institute Chorus uh, in New York. It's not dissimilar to Helga's response last year concerning the actual origins, the point of origin of the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites. wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I certainly don't regret it. I think it was the right thing to do. We hope to intervene to prevent people from being set up and pitted against each other. Uh, we knew that there was a certain amount of anger at a number of these cases as has been addressed. Rage at the police, the police feeling under attack as they are right now, quite extremely. But how do you get above that? Neither group of people is privileged or wealthy. You don't have a lot of millionaires becoming police officers, for example. So how do we get human beings to relate to each other out of respect for the dignity of every single human life and not sink to a lower level? So we organized the sing-along and as people who were involved in that may remember actually during the concert, the thing we had hoped to prevent by raising this discussion to a higher level nonetheless tragically occurred, which is that two police officers were 
assassinated as they sat in their patrol car in Brooklyn. So uh, it really underscored the need, again, for people to come to a higher understanding to address these problems. And I found the chorus, I love our chorus. It's, um, we really miss each other. We've had small rehearsals with masks on and people are listening remotely. But anyone who comes into our chorus always has the reaction that this is, this is really a diverse group, um, all different ages, religions, ethnic backgrounds, etc. And I think people find it um, a place where they, in a sense, can communicate with each other, with other human beings on a higher level that's beyond all of the kind of disagreements and disputes that might divide us otherwise in our daily life. Helga, you wanted to make sure that we continued the celebration of the idea of the year of Beethoven. Uh, and you've always referenced also Beethoven's music in the world played, for example, in 1989. Uh, I just wonder, given now that we're a year after your uh, attempt to organize the committee, and it looks like we finally really have a committee, what your reflections are on both what Diane said, uh, what you've just seen, and uh, what you think about Beethoven in this context. Well, <clears throat> we said that one of the themes of this conference uh, is to make transparent to people that the coincidence of opposites is the only human way of thinking. And <clears throat> I think that the a demonstration which Diane made with the Missa Solemnis, you know, which looks individual voices, looks like chaotic, you know, mistones, it's unpleasant to the ear. But when you see what is the spirit and the method behind the polyphonic composition, harmonic composition, which unfolds, you actually see that you are arriving at, at higher forms of unity. And that is a method of thinking which people can learn. Uh, for example, if you look at some of the most uh, <clears throat> beautiful poems by Schiller, they're exactly composed in this way. Uh, I would <clears throat> advise people to read the uh, beautiful poem, The Artists, where you have that kind of sort of polyphonic back and forth between beauty and science and each enriching each other and both then reaching new levels, and this goes through 33 stanzas, and then at the end, you have this level of unity. It's exactly the same method. Or you take the uh, the poem uh, Die Belle by, by Schiller, where he does it with three levels. Uh, one is the construction of the bell, the, the actually making of the bell physically. Then the second is how parallel to that construction is the individual life in all of its stages. And then on the third level, you have the development of society. And these three levels are interwoven in such a way. And it also ends with uh, concordance, you know, with the unity. So these things have been obviously very much known uh, to the great classical comp composers, you know, Beethoven for sure, Bach very clearly, uh, Schiller, and it's something you can study. And it's very important because it teaches you a method of how to react to situations in real life. For example, Nicolaus of Kuhs uh, <clears throat> applied that same method after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which is when the Turks took over Constantinople with a big bloodbath. And this was regarded to be a big clash of civilization. Uh, but then Nicolaus of Cusa wrote this beautiful um, Socratic dialogue, De Parce Fide, about faith in belief, which you know is a wonderful uh, poor, uh, Socratic dialogue, which also ends with the unity of the one religion above all other religions, the one God, the one truth, which the human mind can, can grasp, and then all the different parties can agree upon. And I think this is a very superior method than, let's say, the method of the British Empire or Samuel Huntington, for that matter, 
who would always talk about the clash of civilization, while our faction in history would always use any such shakeup to find a way of overcoming the conflict and that way bringing mankind forward. So I, I would really encourage people <clears throat> to study this method because you know it was the method of the peace of Westphalia. It was the method of the development of international law. And it is a method which can be applied in all areas <clears throat> of uh, life. And uh, I have uh, in the last year listened to a lot of Beethoven and I can <clears throat> tell you there is nothing better for the soul um, to to do exactly that because it puts you in the mindset, you know, because you have you have to get in in sync with the creative mind of the composer, and it does you a lot of good for any kind of task you want to do on your own. We have a final offering that we're going to be doing for our conference, uh, but before we do it, I want Diane to help me set this up by referring to the fact that the title for your presentation was E Pluribus Unum what we can learn from Beethoven. Now, that is usually associated with the uh, United States flag, the 13 colonies as the United States, and so on. So why did you put those ideas together? Um, sometimes people say that Beethoven is the composer of the American Revolution. Some people say other things. But what were you thinking when you created that title? Well, that from from many one. Um, and I was thinking again about what I've encountered in the my own organizing in the United States, I actually think people have a great potential to be unified. Um, and I think, but they have to be presented with an idea. Uh, it doesn't come arbitrarily, just like Beethoven. I mean, you heard the cacophony before the Mahler Second Symphony. Um, Beethoven took all of that and put it into something which actually became, and I really want to stress this, the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. It's greater than the sum of the parts. There's something people use the term cross voicing without worrying about what that is. But you can imagine that when you have, as Forkel was saying about Bach, a dialogue of voices which are equal, that is they weren't subservient. You heard it in the Beethoven, the orchestra, was not less important than the soloists. Everybody had an equal voice. Nonetheless, they created something which was unified and the what emerged in the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I chose that because I really think that our nation um, urgently needs to live up to that conception. Uh Helga, you did something with the Declaration of Independence, uh, which is really what we're about to go to, uh, taking the idea of the American conception as that was at least outlined by the founders, but then you changed it, uh, and in a few minutes we're going to actually be playing it. But also, together with that, uh, we um, are also going to feature the Rutley Oath, which is from Schiller's play William Tell. So before we go to that and show that, just wanted you to say a few things so that we could set that up uh, and then we'll return with both of you for uh, the final remarks. <clears throat> well, um, you know, when we founded the Schiller Institute in 1984, actually 83, 84, you know, I was thinking what would be the best um, foundation, charter, you know, principles so I looked at many, many documents. I looked at the UN Charter, and I, I came to the conclusion that the Declaration of Independence uh, was the document which would fit the intention of the Schiller Institute best. But naturally, you know, I didn't want to be uh, <clears throat> it limited to one country. So I just uh, <clears throat> changed about six or seven words <clears throat> where it says, you know, the colony, the, the American colony, I say the developing countries, or where it says uh, some uh, something about the British, I say, you know, the international financial institutions. So by changing just these few words, I made it applicable to every country, which I thought 
you know, would express both the fact that every single country on the planet has the right to have such a declaration of independence in terms of its sovereignty and rights and, you know, <clears throat> the uh, right of life, uh, uh, happiness, uh, pursuit of life, liberty and, and happiness. Um, and also by doing it this way, it would open the eyes of the Americans to look at other countries that they do have these same rights. And that way you would create a basis of, you know, exactly the kind of what is in, in, in effect in coherence with the five principles uh, I mentioned earlier in, in my uh, <clears throat> remarks this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, which are the basis of international law. So, you know, I think that now to listen to this, uh, having in mind that this is the effort of the Schiller Institute and it is the right of all people on the planet, you know, to have that kind of a foundation is actually also a basis for peaceful relations in the world today. All right. And so actually, to... the Rudley Oath, the Rudley Oath is. Uh, you know, inspired both by the American Revolution, but it's also a very beautiful uh, poetical conception. And it played a very important role in the history of Switzerland uh, because it took a real story which happened uh, in, I think, the 13th century or yeah, 12th or 13th century in Switzerland. But it was the play of Friedrich Schiller which made it this incredible drama of, of uh, freedom. Uh, which has inspired the Swiss people until the present day. And I insist that even the present uh, recent vote against the three laws, environmental laws, and against the EU inspired the Swiss people to declare their independence in that spirit of Wilhelm Tell and the Rudley Oaths. Hmm. So what we're going to do now is to uh, play a recitation of the Declaration of the Inalienable Rights of Man. Uh, we want to particularly thank Robert Beltran, actor who worked with us actually a couple decades ago with many of the members of the LaRouche Youth Movement and who uh, suddenly appeared and uh, made himself available to help lead this recitation. We're going to follow that by the Rutley Oath uh, and then return. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for the peoples in the world to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of the developing countries, 
and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of violation of national sovereignty through the dictate of supranational institutions. The history of the present international financial institutions is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. They have refused their assent to our plans of development, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. They have forbidden their banks to engage in business of immediate and pressing importance for us, and in equal terms. They have dictated to us terms of trade and relations of currency that have a relationship of our rights as equals in the world community, a right estimable to them and formidable to Thailand's only. They have burdened us with conference after conference to discuss these matters at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of our public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing us into compliance with their measures. They have overthrown legitimate governance repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness their invasions on rights of the people. They have refused for a long time and in many instances, after such sufferings to permit all Republican forces to be elected in a democratic form, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for the exercise. The state of remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of evasions from without and convulsion within. They have endeavored to prevent the necessary population increase for industrialization of these states, for that purpose imposing forced sterilization programs and refusing the necessary technology transfer under the pretext of the so-called protection of the environment. They have obstructed justice by giving aid and comfort to undemocratic forces whom they regarded as their assets. They have made judges dependent on their will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. They have erected a multitude of new offices and sent swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. They have used the military might of governments to pursue the continuation of a de facto condition of colonialism. They have, in many instances, furthered military forms of government to impose the demanded austerity. They have combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitutions and unacknowledged by our laws, giving their assent to their acts of pretended legislation. For using the territory of our countries for proxy and population wars, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, imposing, for imposing conditionalities on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases on the benefits of trial by jury, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. They have caused conditions in our countries which destroyed the lives of our people. They have generally caused our countries, already previously weakened and exploited by colonialism, to collapse with methods of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, totally unworthy of man in civilized nations. They have excited domestic insurrections among us and have endeavored to bring on the most backward and fanatic savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every step of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions and resolutions have been answered only by repeated injury. Institutions whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant are unfit to be the rulers of free peoples. We have appealed to them in innumerable conferences, assemblies, and conventions, 
and appeal to their sense of justice without any positive response. We, therefore, the representatives of the peoples of the world, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of all good people of all countries, solemnly publish and declare that all the countries of the world are and of right ought to be free and independent states. That all human beings on this planet have inalienable rights, which guarantee them life, freedom, material conditions worthy of man, and the right to develop fully all potentialities of their intellect and their souls. That therefore a change in the present monetary and economic order is necessary and urgent to establish justice among the peoples of the world. These were in large part the formulations of the American Declaration of Independence, and no honest witness can deny that all we wish to remedy are the same unjust conditions which the Founding Fathers wished to remove when they ended their condition as colonies to establish the first true independent republic. It is this example we wish to replicate everywhere, and it is these principles we wish to uphold. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. No, there is a limit to the tyrant's power. When the oppressed can find no justice, when the burden grows unbearable, he reaches with hopeful courage up unto the heavens and seizes hither his eternal rights, which hang above, inalienable and indestructible as stars themselves. The primal state of nature reappears where man stands opposite his fellow man. As a last resort, when not another means is of avail, the sword is given him. The highest of all goods we may defend from violence. Thus stand we before our country. Thus stand we before our wives and before our children. We will become a single land of brothers, nor shall we part in danger and distress. We shall be free, just as our fathers were, and sooner die than live in slavery. We shall rely upon the highest God, and we shall never fear the might of men. Let me point out in this uh, one week before the uh, July 4th celebration of the United States that the persons that recited the Declaration of the Inalienable Rights of Man hail from France, Colombia, El Salvador, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, so we're at the conclusion of the entire conference at this point, and I uh, was caused partially to think about uh, someone that uh, is not with us, uh, but who was brought to mind because of the words and the cadence of the words of uh, Dr. Satcher, and that's Amelia Boynton Robinson. Amelia was a uh, uh, was the vice chair of the Schiller Institute, uh, worked with us for many years, 25 years, extremely close to Helga. And actually, Diane, you knew her very well as well. And I think uh, as we summarize here, I'd like uh, uh, Diane first to just get your response, both in terms of what you've just heard and what a sort of a choral approach we took to that reading of the Declaration of the Inalienable Rights of Man, but also of the larger themes that we've, uh, we've talked about in the conference as a whole. Uh, and then we'll uh, have Helga sort of conclude the entirety of the proceedings for the last two days. Okay. Well, I actually really wanted to thank Helga for her opening presentation because it was so clear and the concluding point on the development, um, including emphatically in the United States, which 
really no one is talking about. People have set their sights very low uh, in terms of expectations for what might be done here, and I imagine it's similar in, in Western Europe. People don't think of transcontinental railroads or building new cities or any of the things that really were part of the identity of the United States when our republic was created and for quite a while afterwards. And uh, Lyndon LaRouche really was, I would say, the greatest son of America thus far because of his passionate commitment to that quality of goodness, which he also recognized was universal, which is why he was also a universal citizen, a world citizen. So I would just like to close by challenging everybody to review the contents of this conference and to be demanding of yourself. We have an enormous task ahead of us, as I think we've heard, and uh, I believe we can be successful, but it is not guaranteed. So Helga, now that we've reached the conclusion of what we hope we have accomplished in this last two days, what would you uh, like to say in, in conclusion? And uh, thank you, first of all, for convening it, and thank you for your inspiration in having people, despite themselves, rise above what they may have thought were contradictions for the purpose of uh, creating this assembly? Well, I think we are under the incredible tension of what was discussed because you think about it, it was quite enormous. I mean, going to the edge of what could become a nuclear war repeatedly and we will have these maneuvers in the in the Black Sea, starting shortly, um, which will be the danger of repetitions of such provocations as we have seen it by this uh, British warship. So we will be in a in a state of tension, and I have no idea if this proposal or this idea to transform the uh, American military production and related things into a peaceful thing. Maybe this is completely utopian. Um, that 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 is possible. But I I'm you know I'm an internal optimist that you know maybe the combination of these ideas you know the the danger that it cannot be in the interest of anybody that this goes out of control, and at the same time you know the demonstrated goodwill of the last panel in particular. You know where doctors just jump in and military men have offered you know that the military could help by providing clean water for the world i think there are enough ideas so that you know hopefully something will go out of this uh, which will make a difference so i would you know urge all of you who are watching this to make a step and become active with us thank you diane Thank you, Helga, and thank all of you that have participated in our conference for the common good of all people, not rules benefiting the few. You all, I think, have your assignments and your mission, and we invite you to join us in working with us to complete that mission, not on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of humanity as a whole. Thank you. This concludes our conference.